could please stand and salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Counselors, I do... Uh, I do first of all want to thank Mike Thomas and, uh, and Kathy Smith, uh, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent uh, of schools for accommodating. Um, I, will, I will tell those that are here in the, cha in the chamber tonight or at the little theater tonight and those watching on TV, reason uh, why we're not at City Hall in Brockton is where we usually meet on the first and third Monday of every month, seven o'clock is a finance committee meeting, is that the elevator is broken. And under the open meeting law, you need to go to a venue that has accessibility to handicapped individuals. So thus, the school department allowed us to come here tonight. Uh, Councilors, I don't have an expectation on when we'll be going back to City Hall. Uh, as you know, we had this occurrence in the summertime and, and it took about a month to rectify that situation. So um, we will, uh, at this time, just try to uh, grin, and, grin and bear it and see uh, you know, what happens in the near future. But I do also want to say Councilor Stadensky, the Ward 4 Councilor, uh, is unable to join us tonight. Uh, he's not feeling that well, but, uh, but he did want to send his best wishes to his colleagues on the Council. With that being said, we're going to go in, Madam Clerk. Uh, and I also want to thank both uh, Mel and Connie uh, for really working diligently on uh, accommodating this and, and making this happen tonight. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of agenda items, a lot of invites, and uh, they really uh, they went above and beyond. So thank you to both of you. Um, if we could go on to agenda item uh, number one, please. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Blueberry Circle, extending from Dudley Avenue to Dudley Avenue, a distance of about 650 feet, more or less, and for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes. Invited, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, Howard B. Newton, DPW Superintendent of Engineering. Time having arrived, this is a, a public hearing. I am gonna call the hearing uh, to order. Uh, those in favor, please come to the podium and, and state your name for the clerk, please. Lawrence Raleigh, DPW Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Um, Raleigh. And we have no objections on this request. Okay. Councilor Lally, is this your ward? Uh, or is this Councilor Stadensky's? It's Councilor Stadensky's. I know you're working in tandem on these items. Uh, Councilors, any, any, any questions relative to this matter to the DPW Commissioner? Is there, thank you, Mr. Raleigh. Is there anyone else here? in the theater tonight uh, that is in favor of this matter. Anyone here in favor? If so, please come s and state your name to the clerk. Third and final time, is there anyone here on agenda item number one in favor of this matter? Seeing none, that part of the hearing is closed. Is there anyone here in opposition? If, is there anyone here that opposes this? If so, please come forward. Third and final time, anyone here opposed? Madam, you, are you opposed to this? You just need to, I'm sorry, for, for, you need to come forward. This is item, this is item number one. So, so this is agenda item number one, uh, and it's, it's, it's in Ward 4. We're talking about Blueberry Circle. Do you, do you have a... Okay, so you have an interest on this. So if you wanted to come forward to the podium, we, we would need to do that properly. Just because it's being filmed for TV and we need to, we need to do it the proper way. So if you wanted to talk about this, by all means, we'd, we'd welcome you to come down. Councilor Falwell. Mr. Chairman, Councilor Stadensky and I uh, co-filed the acceptance of this street and the next one that's coming up. Blueberry Circle is in such disrepair that there are actually uh, stones, rocks being pushed up through the surface and even if you tried to walk that street, you could stub your toe or an elderly person could fall. So that's why it's on the agenda. And I, uh, unless uh, the young lady would like to speak, I'd move favorable recommendation. A point of information, Thank madam, I'll just as the chair and as the city council president, I'll explain. Um, when there are certain roads within the city of Brockton that are private ways, the ward council and or the city council at large can work with the city to put it forward to make it deemed a public way. So that, that's what's happening right here. On agenda item number one, Councilor Stadensky, the ward councilor, and Councilor Farwell have petitioned to make sure that the private way will be deemed a public way if it's passed. 
it, the, the purpose of having a public way is more beneficial to the resident because at that time it's a street asset, meaning it can be plowed, it can be paved, potentially there could be sidewalks. There's a lot that can be done. When it's a private way, and I happen to live on a private way, the residents own to the center line, the city doesn't. So it, the, the difference between private versus public is just that. It's more beneficial, but if you oppose that or if you favor that and you want to speak, by all means. Councilor Lally. Do, do you have any questions, ma'am? You, you could just do it from there. Okay, <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. There is a motion on the floor by uh, Councilor Fowler to send this back favorable. There's a second by Mr. Monahan. All in favor of favorable recommendation back to the council, please raise your hand. All opposed, that matter is gonna carry. It's a favorable recommendation back to the city council. Number two, please. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Dudley Avenue, extending from Parker Avenue northerly about 775 feet, more or less, and for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes. Invited, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, Howard B. Newton, DPW Superintendent Engineer. Time having arrived, I hereby declare this part of the hearing open. If those are in favor, please come forward to state your name to the clerk. Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, and we have no objections to this request either. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Any questions for the DPW Commissioner Councils? Anyone else here in favor? Anyone in the chamber in favor about this third and final time? Anyone here in favor? That part of the hearing is going to be closed. Is there anyone here that opposes this matter? Again, it was filed by Councilor Stanensky, the Ward Councilor, and seconded by Mr. Fowler, Councilor Lodge. Anyone here oppose this? Seeing none, third and final time, I'm going to close that part of the hearing. I entertain a motion, please. Make a motion for favorable recommendation. Second. Second. It's a favorable recommendation, properly second and favorable recommendation back to full council. If you're in favor of that, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, that motion carries. Number two is a favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Number three, Madam Clerk. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Brookville Avenue, extending from Boundary Street to North Quincy Street, a distance of about 1,410 feet, more or less. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes. Invited Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, Howard B. Newton, DPW Superintendent Engineer. Time having arrived, I'm going to declare this part of the hearing open. If there's only here in favor, please state your name to the clerk. Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, and we have no objections to this request. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Mr. Lally, do you have any statements? This is your award. Uh, only that you know these these people are paying the same taxes as everyone else they deserve the same fair treatment excellent thank you anyone else here in favor <coughs> anyone here in the in the theater in favor of this matter third and final time anyone here in f do you want to go on record that you support it or just a resident resident support it yes. okay if you're a resident and you support this please raise your hand one two three four five six seven we have seven for the, uh, for the minutes, please. Seven favor residents. We're gonna close that part of the hearing. Anyone here in opposition? Anyone here on this matter opposed? Third and final time, that part of the hearing is closed. I entertain a motion, Councilor. Motion to recommend favor. Second. Second. So motion on the floor was properly seconded. It's a favor recommendation back to full council. If you're in favor of that, please raise your hand. If you oppose, that motion carries. Favor recommendation back to full council. Number four, Madam Clerk. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Gary Road, extending from Boundary Avenue to Brookville Avenue, a distance of 1,131,000, sorry, 1,131.46 feet. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes. Invited Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, Howard B. Newton, DPW Superintendent Engineer. Time having arrived, I'm going to declare this part of the hearing open. If there's anyone here in favor, please come forward and state your name to the clerk. Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, and we have no objections to this Thank request. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Lally again. Uh, again, as, as, the, as with uh, Brookville Ave, uh, these, these people you know, are paying the same taxes. Uh, they deserve the same treatment. Uh, these roads are in uh, rough shape, and it's the least we can do to make them eligible to be paved. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, is there anyone else here in the little theater that is uh, in favor of this? Do you want to come forward or just want to be noted as such? Okay. One, two. Any other resident? Three. Pardon me? This is in regards to Gary Road, agenda item number four. I believe there's three people that raised their hand, if we could reflect that in the minutes. 
Is there anyone else here in favor? Third and final time, I'm going to close that part of the hearing. Anyone here in opposition? Anyone here oppose this matter? Third and final time, I'm going to close that part of the hearing. Entertain a motion. motion Counselor? Recommend favorable. Second. Second. This motion on the floor was properly seconded. It's a favorable recommendation back to the full council. If you're in favor of that, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, that motion carries. It's a favorable recommendation back to the full council. Last public hearing of the evening relative to uh, private ways is number five, please. Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Randolph Avenue extending from Boundary Avenue to Brookville Avenue, a distance of 1,117.82 feet. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes. Invited, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, Howard B. Newton, DPW Superintendent Engineer. Time have arrived. I declare this part of the hearing open. If there's anyone here in favor, please come forward and state your name to the clerk. Lawrence Riley, DPW Commissioner, and we have no objections to this request. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Mr. Lally again, Council Lally. Uh, same, as, same as the last two. Uh, say paying the same taxes, deserve the same treatment. Thank you, Council. Is there anyone else here, any resident here, any, any uh, constituent here in favor of this matter? Do you want to come forward and state your name? Good evening, ma'am. If you could just go to the podium, just because it's being reflected on cable TV tonight. I'm Sheila Keene. I live in Randolph Ave. Um, I just had one question. The uh, 50 feet, is that um, for a sidewalk on one side of the street or on both? This is, this is really not a, not a, not a, major way so i just wanted to wanted to understand that thank you councilor lally i i believe the the commissioner would best be able to answer it if uh but i i, I just want to just want to say this is this is just this is to make the road uh eligible to be paved yes there's no uh money attached to this and there's no uh timetable for it to act for it to actually be paved yes this is just yeah well, I, I am in favor. We've, we've lived uh, on the street since 1978, and it's been deteriorating since I've been here. Right. Thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you. If we could reflect that in the minutes. Is there any other residents in favor of this matter? Third and final time, I want to close that part of the hearing. Anyone here in opposition? Anyone oppose this matter? <coughs> Second time, anyone oppose it? Third and final time, the part of the hearing is closed. Entertain a motion, please. Motion to recommend favor. It's motion on the floor. It was properly seconded. It's a favorable recommendation. Back to the full council. If you're in favor of that, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, that motion carries. Madam Clerk, it's a favorable recommendation. Back to the full council. Uh, if I could just remind everybody, even though we're not at City Hall in the chamber, the rule of the City Council, be it Finance Committee or full City Council, is to uh, have gentlemen please remove their hats in, in the chamber. And I'm going to ask uh, respectfully if we could do that as well here tonight. Thank you very much. We're going to go on to agenda item number six, please. Order that the city hereby accepts as a grant and gift from Anthony Prosper of 108 Belcher Ave, Brockton, a flag box to be donated to the City of Brockton Fire Department. The estimated value of the flag box is $550. The gift will be used by the City of Brockton Veteran Services Department for collection and proper flag disposal. Invited Anthony Prosper, Michael F. Williams, Chief Brockton Fire Department, David A. Farrell, Director, Veteran Services. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Councilors. So my involvement in this was about a month ago, one of my captains approached me, said a very good friend of his son was working on his Eagle Scout project, and would I be willing to accept a donation of part of his project to be put on one of my fire station properties? And I was in agreement to that. I don't know if Mr. Farrell has anything to say, but when we are done, uh, Anthony Prosper is here, uh, he can speak on this issue if you have any questions for him. Well, first of all, I, 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 for full disclosure, my son, uh, one of my sons is in PAC 2000, and Mr. Prosper is really a mentor to the boys in the Boys Scouts PAC 2000. So, Anthony, we want to thank you, first of all, for joining us here tonight. And I know we have Mr. Farrow as well. Anthony, do you want to uh, have any, any conversation with the, with the city councils on this? We really applaud you for your efforts. Thank you. Um, so, my project is underway and my deadline is February because that's when my 18th birthday is, but yeah, um, the box is, I estimated around 550 and that's, I'm building two boxes. So 
one will be donated to the fire station six and then the other will be donated to the fire museum on Pearl Street. That's awesome, that's awesome. Mr. Cruz, it's a Ward 1 resident right there. Yeah, I file this at the request of the chief, but uh, I've been uh, a customer of Mr. Prosper's for many years for the Boy Scout and Cub Scout uh, <laughs> popcorn program. <laughs> and actually, I just, uh, he's busy this year. I just had to complain to him that we don't have this year's supply of popcorn yet. So uh, if you can get by and take care of that, we'll, I appreciate it. But I think they're selling no calorie popcorn this year, popcorn Tim. I think you and I healthy. are in good, yeah, we're in good we shape. We buy the no butter. It's very healthy for you. It's a, it's a much better snack than ice cream. So uh, it, it's been a great, uh, and it's great popcorn for anybody who gets a chance to purchase it. But uh, the Girl Scouts get all the credit for, uh, for food, but the, the popcorn is great that the Boy Scouts have. So uh, this is a great, uh, it's, it's really exciting to have an Eagle Scout uh, in the neighborhood, and uh, we're very proud of them, and I want to thank you, and uh, if anybody else has any questions at, at that point, I'll recommend favorably. Any other, con any other counselors have questions for Mr. Prosper? Anthony, we want to again thank you. We want to congratulate you. Uh, again, you're a champion within the city of champions, so thank you. Mr. Thank Farrell. You. Before, before we move on the motion, uh, perhaps for some of the people at home, I'd ask Mr. Farrell to explain what, just what the flag box and why, uh, why it's important to have. Uh, if, if you could maybe give a brief explanation of what a flag box is. Yes, yes thank you very much. Uh, well, a flag box uh, will be a receptacle for retired American flags. Uh, as you know, out of respect for the American flag, we never uh, throw it away as we would a piece of trash, uh, discard it in any kind of disrespectful manner. Uh, but in order to satisfy kind of the uh, requirements of the honor that the American flag uh, uh, needs, we, we have places for the flags to be dropped off. Uh, my office, uh, when we uh, take in flags that are no longer serviceable, uh, we bring them to the VFW and they have a retirement ceremony a couple of times a year. and. Uh, I often get requests from people, what do I do with my American flag? And of course, I have them bring them to my office. Uh, but this will be a lot, uh, be a great benefit for the city because we'll have a couple of locations where people can bring them and uh, uh, also <laughs> instill that uh, respect we need for the American flag. Thank you. Thank you, David, for being here. We, we, I'd recommend favorably. The motion on the floor, it's been properly seconded. It's a favorable recommendation. Back to the full council. If you're in favor of that, please raise your hand. Your pose that motion carries. It's a thank favorable you. recommendation back to full council. Again, Mr. Prosper, thank you for joining us tonight. Next agenda item, agenda item, please. Order. An ordinance amending Chapter 27 zoning of the revised ordinances of the City of Brockton by adding Article 58, Thatcher Street Smart Growth Overlay District, TSS God. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Robert May, Director, Planning, Economic and Development, Attorney James Burke, David Aiken, and our representative from the Planning Office uh, for Urban Affairs. Councilors, as you recall, <clears throat> at our last meeting uh, last week at the City Council Chambers, uh, Councilor Fowle asked that this item be sent back to the Finance Committee for uh, some further um, questions and answers that the uh, councilors may have in regards to those people that have been invited before us. And uh, I believe um, all are, well, I don't know if all are here. Um, I don't know if I see Mr. Condon. I haven't seen Mr. Condon in the house. And is he here? Okay, I just have, sorry, Mr. Condon, didn't see that you were here. Mr. Mayor, I don't know if he's, if he's present or not. I didn't see him. Uh, Attorney Burke, I did see, and I also saw uh, David is, is here. I did not see um, Mayor Carpenter as well. So in any case, yeah, I'm going to turn this um, at this point over to Councilor Fowle, and um, I know because you had recommended that you come back here, and, and uh, if you want to start the dialogue to the question you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank everyone who is here on this particular <coughs> agenda item. Um, by way of background, uh, Councilor Borgard held a ward meeting at the Pluff Academy and Councillor Rodriguez and I dropped in to participate. And this happened to be a topic of great interest to the people in that area, which really is Thatcher Street, I think, bisects Ward 5 and Ward 4. Uh, to say that there was a fairly robust discussion about this would perhaps be the classic understatement, but it was robust and it was uh, pointed 
And as we tried to answer as many questions as we could, uh, it became obvious that we couldn't answer all the questions because frankly we don't know every little detail of this project. So what I'd like to do, uh, hopefully to save time, is ask some specific questions of the different people who are here, um, remembering the issues that were brought forth at the meeting at the Plouffe Academy, and then throw it open for my colleagues to ask any questions. Uh, because it's really important uh, when we have public policy decisions to make, it's really important that we present clear and unambiguous information to the public. We didn't do this in this case. I'm not sure why. Uh, to me, it's a learning experience that uh, somehow we've got to get out to a butters when we have an overlay district coming in and do more than just hold a hearing or, or engage in a meeting. But uh, having said that, I'd like to ask Mr. May, who is our planning director here now, would, because I think you were one of the movers of this with Councillor Studensky. Tell us from your perspective the benefit to the city of Brockton which this overlay district will, will uh, provide. I just want to, if I might, just, just interrupt one, one second before you begin because I, I want to keep it on track to the fact that that's what we're here to discuss this evening is the fact that we're talking about an overlay district. And I think that's most important because that's what the council had acted upon through the ordinance committee uh, was, was the overlay district. Yes, there's a project that goes with it, but that's not the full discussion of, of tonight. So I just want to keep that, keep that on track, okay? Correct. Sorry I didn't notice you here early, but no my problems. apologies. Go right ahead, Mr. May, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Rob May. I'm Director of Planning and Economic Development. And to answer your question, sir, uh, I think one of the first benefits that we should uh, establish is that for applying and um, creating this new overlay district, the Department of uh, Housing and Community Development will grant to the city of Brockton approximately uh, $200,000. I, I don't say approximately, it is $200,000, excuse me. Uh, also, um, another benefit is that as the city builds the units, or as the units are built, uh, and they receive certificates of occupancy, we get, we the city gets $3,000 for each unit that comes online. And so the grand total of that unit can, will vary with the number of units over time, but we're looking at um, an additional 495,000 if the whole um, 175 units are built. Uh, the next eligible activity that, that we need to talk about is um, Massachusetts 40S, which is a provision under the state law that says that if a community adopts a smart growth district and uh, with some other caveats, if the tax revenue that the district is generating does not provide enough money to handle any net new students to the district uh, that are coming from that district, the state then uh, steps in to, to make up the difference. Uh, and lastly, um, and, and probably one of the biggest and ongoing uh, benefits to this district, aside from the fact that we're creating um, quality affordable housing for Brockton residents uh, is that we'll be collecting approximately 240,000 give or take in uh, tax revenue every year from property tax. All right, I'd like to go back to the 40S issue. Who makes the determination as to whether the revenue is sufficient for the number of children that might live there? We fill out um, reports to the state every year uh, with the assistance of the school department. They tell us how many students are living in, in that area or, or what their uh, um, revenues are, uh, our expenses are, and then we work with the landlord to determine how many students are there. We then determine who are those, uh, are they net new students um, or are they uh, being transferred from other coming from other places in, in Brockton. So there's a whole formula and process for doing that and it's done on an annual basis. Right, but worst case scenario, we'd get nothing. Best case scenario, we would get something based on the analysis that's done. It, if, if there was a shortfall, yes, sir. Okay, and with respect to the $200,000 from the Department of Community and Housing Development and the $3,000 per unit based on certificates of occupancy issued one-time payments, correct? Those are one-time payments, one -time yes. One-time payments. All right, is it fair to say that if, if this is approved by the council, 
This is the first stop on a number of different reviews, project reviews. In other words, the issue was raised at the Plus Academy. This will not go to planning. If the council appropriates or if the council approves this, we've streamlined the whole process and it's a done deal. So talk to me a little bit about what would happen if the overlay district is approved, where would the project go from there pursuant to Massachusetts state law? Well, as, as you've seen um, in the zoning application uh, to you, the amendment, there are very um, strict guidelines. We talk about in, in the zoning language how tall the buildings can be, how far uh, from each other they need to be, how much parking, um, what kind of, uh, there's also design guidelines that go with that to talk about the architectural details of the buildings, um, how much open space land use. So that in itself is now codified. So they have to build up to that amount. They can't build more. They can't build with different materials. Um, if you're, you're creating the, the tightest case of zoning that you can possibly do. So these standards are in, in, enacted by city council and, and they will guide the development of this project. Now, when the property owner then steps forward and says, we would like to build a project, whoops, excuse me, in accordance with 40R, they have a series of uh, applications and documents that they have to submit to the city. And it's outlined in the zoning ordinance that you're passing or potentially passing. It says exactly what they need to have, which are full site plans, full um, uh, architectural uh, uh, elevations, um, the statement of public benefits and proposed mitigation. They need to have a lighting plan, a stormwater management plan, and any other plans that are required by the planning board, which would include a traffic study. Those documents then come into the planning office and we send them to a independent third uh, outside party, third party, that works for the city, but is paid for through uh, the applicant. So we've hired a, uh, an engineer, um, we're in the process of, of renewing a contract with, with that engineer now uh, that's done all of our 40R work uh, in the past. They review the material, it comes back in a report to the planning board that says, is it complete, is it appropriate, do they meet the guidelines, do they meet all the requirements, and if not, what are the, the missing pieces? That document is then presented at tech review, which is a meeting that we have once a month in City Hall where every single city department is invited to come and comment uh, on this process. Those comments are then incorporated into the next version of the draft, which then comes to the planning board. The planning board has to have a public hearing at that time. And now at this time, uh, because there's an actual project in the making, there is a public notification where the abutters within 300 feet um, are to receive uh, certified mail to let them know when this uh, hearing is going to be. Uh, at that time, all the information is presented. The, the public can testify, uh, both abutters and non-abutters. And then um, after uh, analysis, the, the planning board will make a decision. Uh, if the project is approved, what you're approving, what the planning board approves, is the letter of the law. They can't deviate from that plan without coming back to the planning board. There is a demand to live in Brockton from people who live here now but would like to move into another setting. Yes, sir. Is it possible to restrict or to otherwise designate a certain percentage of these units for people going from Brockton to Brockton? Or do you have to open it up and anyone from anywhere in the state can, uh, can compete? We have been working with the developer, uh, the proposed developer, and they are going to um, put on a percentage preference, I believe it's 70? 70% 70 uh, local preference, uh, trying to uh, bring Brockton residents into this development. Uh, as you said, there, there is a huge demand for people looking for quality housing that are already here in Brockton. Um, whether they're you know, working at the mall or working at the university or at the college, um, we need uh, appropriately priced quality housing. Uh, and I think that the 70% um, uh, target is, is a good 
um, a place to be at. All right. Am I accurate to say this does not involve any crematorium? That was the other issue that seemed to be floating around the other night. This is strictly a, uh, th Good there's, God. No par there's no partnership with anyone else, there's no quid pro quo that we're going to do this and then phase two is this or? I've heard of cradle to grave, but that's no. Well, I didn't like that thought myself in my age bracket, so. No, I'm, I'm getting up there, sir, and I'm not ready for that. Uh, do we have a, based on your professional experience, do we know approximately how many children we might anticipate living in, in that uh, development? Because we're, we're hearing hundreds could move into the city, and we do receive $14,761 in reimbursement for every child who is on the enrollment uh, ledger, so to speak, as of October 1st. To the extent that we're losing some children to charter schools in a controlled way, it might be beneficial to have more, but I also understand the residents' concerns that this could become a, uh, I, I don't want to say an out of control development, but a, a worrisome issue for them who have, for those who have lived peacefully in single family residences down in that area. Well, I understand the nuns can get pretty wild down there too, so. I've heard that. Yeah. I, I, I don't blame it, don't blame it all on the kids. Um, it, it, the experience that we have with developments in Brockton um, that are our 40 yard districts, if you look at the station uh, lofts or um, uh, Trinity's Enterprise Center and um, um, uh, Enzo Flats, uh, between those three projects, uh, there's approximately 30 students um, scattered throughout the age bracket, so it's not all in one uh, group. The vast majority of those students are not net new to the city of Brockton, or are net new, or are net, are pre-existing students within the city of Brockton. That's, that was a tough one. Uh, so it wasn't adding uh, additional people to the, to the payroll, or to the school district. I would ask um, or, or give leave to the developer, they've done a little bit more analysis on their particular project and can address that in more detail if you'd like. All right. Uh, I think, oh, I, no, I guess that's all I have for you now. I, I, thank you. I don't know if anyone else has anything for uh, Mr. May. I have some for the other people who are here. Anything else from Mr. May, uh, Council Monahan? Yeah. Good evening, Mr. May. Good evening, um, sir. At the ordinance meeting when we were talking about that, um, a question came up because we have foundation funding for the school department that the 40S would not be uh, applicable. And I think our legislative council was supposed to look into that. I haven't heard anything back on that. Have, have you? Uh, I have not heard from legislative council. I do know that uh, this is uh, a year that we are paying fund, uh, uh, contributing foundation. And I would, I would let um, uh, Mr. Condon uh, comment further on the city's finances. It's, it is above my pay grade. Oh, oh sorry. There you are. <laughs> Councillor, uh, whether the city is or is not meeting its foundation target is an issue for each and every year's appropriation. As uh, Mr. May said, this year we are at the uh, foundation uh, target amount. Some years we've been below, some years we've been above. So we have a calculation that was required each and every year. Uh, I don't think um, when we miss, we don't miss by much, and when we're over, we don't miss by much. I would make one other comment, though, with respect to the charter school uh, issue. Uh, when we lose students, to the charter school. We also lose the state, uh, the, not just the state revenue, but the full cost of our average cost to educate those uh, students. And as you know, if you lose a student from a school to, the, to one of the charter schools, say it's $14,000 in, in revenue that goes away with them, we don't lose $14,000 worth of cost. So a new student coming into the system would be receiving the full $14,000 worth of revenue, and we wouldn't be adding $14,000 worth of cost for one new student at a school. It just doesn't work that way. The incremental cost or the added cost per student isn't anything nearly like the average cost. Right, so, but is the 40S still ap it's applicable? Well, I think it would be applicable on every year's examination. The question would be, are you or are you not at your foundation obligation? Okay. It would okay. be a calculation for every year. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Connor. Thank you. Welcome, Council. Council Borgard, do you still want to ask um, yes. Mr. May a question? Please, thank you. 
Good evening, Council. Okay, one of, one of my very many concerns with this project is, okay, if it were voted to be a 40R overlay district, and suddenly things have a problem and the developer can't come through, et cetera, something like that, wh where are we? Does that mean that everyone else can come up and say, oh, we can build 40R, or are we stuck? Can we ever change when the a, definition? When a, um, the 40R district that we're, we're writing now, that is in front of you, is very specific to this piece of property. Um, it, it doesn't build well anyplace else. And when they come forward with an application and we issue a permit, it's that permit is what they have to build. They can't get a permit to say, oh, I'm going to do this and then come back and do that. Because mm. they'll, the building department uh, who we work closely with will stop them in the middle of construction. Um, they will be building out over the next 10 years. Um, I don't foresee every single building coming online at the same time. So we do expect it to be phased, but what you get is what's on that permit. Okay, I'm sorry, that's not what I was asking. I'm simply saying this has nothing to do with the developer. We've, if we're, this were to be voted on for a 40, uh, you know, our overlay district that does not exist now, and the developer were to fall through, then are we stuck with that being designated as a 40 R district, or can we turn around and propose something else and, and stop the whole, you know, all the process all over again. I think if the development were to fail, there would be other avenues for um, uh, secondary development folks to step in. Because these are um, going to be done through a series of, of credits issued by the state and federal government, um, the the review process is very thorough to make sure that they can deliver the product that they say they're going to deliver. Well, I understand what you're saying, but already we've had some problems with some of our 40R. For example, I'll, I'll cite Enzo Flats, which I know will not receive its second uh, proposal for, or I, w I call it the third proposal because the second one's really the parking garage, and apparently they did not uh, meet in the interim. We, you mentioned, you brought up the students, and the, the 40R that is at uh, Center Street and Montello and Main Street, that used to be the Enterprise and the Gardner Building, that is apartment style, 40R and also um, market rate, in other words. Um, and there's very few students, generally young children, that live in that t type of dynamic. Now this proposal is more of a townhouse style, and this, you know, I would say it makes it more family oriented, I'll put that in quotes. So it's a little hard to compare that. Station Lofts is exactly that. Lofts, it used to be a factory that they turned around having toured both places and seeing, I can understand where there would not be a lot of young children in a dynamic like that, maybe babies, and then families, you know, pursue some other um, place to raise their children. It be near more of a school, you know, playground dynamic, et cetera. So I don't feel that that's, a, you know, an idea to compare that. But what I'm concerned with is because we've seen things fall through before. We see proposals. I mean, I attend these site review meetings, and we'll cite one group that came what six times, and we still see nothing from what they are granted. It's a different uh, project. But anyway, having said that that if this were decided to be 40R and this falls through, can uh, the city make a, you know, a new designation for that property? If, if, it were? if somebody wanted to take over the property, um, it, it still has its underlying um, R1C zoning. And if somebody wanted okay. to build the three single family homes that is allowable by law, they're more than welcome to do that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. All set, Councilor. Councilor Rodriguez. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was actually at the same meeting that Council Fowell was at, and uh, some of the concerns that he, um, he actually addressed, but there was, an, there was something else that came up in that meeting. 
which is the issue of taxation. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, quite a few people at that meeting basically said that since the, um, the developer is part of the, uh, part of the church, and the church tends to be a nonprofit organization, uh, there were some questions or some issues, actually there were some statements made that, that that property itself would not be able to pay, would not be able to pay taxes into the community. Um, could you just uh, clarify uh, some of that, that because... That assumption is, is incorrect on behalf of, of whoever was uh, making that. Um, under Massachusetts General Law, the Assessor's Handbook, um, properties that rent real estate for residential or even commercial purposes are taxable properties, regardless of who owns those. <coughs> Additionally, because these projects are being de uh, developed with um, uh, tax credits and, um, and other state mechanisms, they have to be uh, owned and operated by a, a full, full ah, for-profit LLC um, that is going to continue to pay um, real estate taxes. So if the church turned around two, three years down the road once the project is done and decides to sell the project off to another nonprofit, the taxation would still be in play because yes, the properties will still be taxed. Yes. And when you're looking at it in terms of um, generation of income, what are we talking about? Let's say, assuming that it's 175 um, pieces of property that are being built, what, is, what does that do for, uh, for the tax base here in the city? We had worked with the assessor's office. We think we, um, based on the, the documents and information that the developer had shared, we're thinking it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $240,000 a year. In taxable in, in, income? In, as a tax payment, yes. To the city? Yes. All right. Now, um, are there any possibilities in terms of um, us adding some conditions? And I think Council Fowell brought that up with some conditions attached to this particular project. Um, when will we, for instance, will have that opportunity to do that? Because there's some issues with, you know, could we ask the, the developers to do something with sidewalks? Can we ask the developers to do something in terms of uh, assisting in the um, keeping the fire station open? And those kinds of things. Uh, when, uh, at what point do we, as citizens or representatives mm -hmm. of the people, have a say in what conditions we can put in? Uh, there's two opportunities. One is now during the uh, zoning hearing process um, where the text of the zoning amendment could potentially be changed on the floor of, of council. But the next opportunity would be at the permitting stage. When they come forward with us with a plan, with the traffic studies, we will see everything out you know, on paper um, in front of us, and that's the time when we see if there's a, a traffic problem that we need to address. Um, we obviously are a complete streets community, so we're going to be looking for improved uh, pedestrian crossings and sidewalks in that area, and uh, several other issues may come up at that time. But that's, that is the next opportunity we have to take a, a bite at this apple. So again, just to make it, just to make it clear and crystal clear, uh, there is absolutely no uh, thinking that that property will become a non-taxable property. Uh, none. None. All right. Thank you, Mr. None. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Council. Councilor Azak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Mr. May. Uh, but my question's for the um, Mr. Aiken, or I believe from the planning office. You're present, right? Correct. Good. You can stare into this light now. <laughs> Good evening. I also have uh, Lisa Alberghini, who's our president, here with me. In case oh, very like good. To... Well, thank you. I just I recognized you from the um, zoning, um, the ordinance meeting when you were here and you presented the plans uh, to the ordinance committee. So my question to you, and I, I know we're voting on the overlay district this this evening, but um, I did see the plans when you presented them to the ordinance committee, and some of the concerns that the communities had, and what I've heard is. Um, they're concerned about once these units are uh, leased, rented, that they may start out with, you know, a couple or there's one or two bedroom units, but before you know it, they might have, you know, numerous people living in them. 
and I just wanted to put them at ease. I mean, we, we have units that we lease and there's leases and somehow how can we protect the community from having um, this development turn into uh, like crowded apartments? Sure. Well, we, we own and we own for the foreseeable f for a very long period of time all of our properties. We we've, we've have not sold anything in a very long period of time. We work incredibly close with all of our uh, property management uh, companies, and it, it's uh, simply a uh, you know, very uh, strict process of how many uh, individuals of any age are in any particular household. Um, there's uh, state codes. Um, there's others, as we discussed, you know, there are various uh, income pieces associated with some of the, some of the units here. Um, so there isn't the ability to just move from one, uh, one apartment to another size or to just add additional people to, uh, to an apartment. Uh, that's all sort of vetted on, in, the income pro in the incoming intake process. Okay, very good. And um, so do you have property managers on site? That from, I know you have different properties around the state, I believe, if you don't mind telling us where or where yes, you have we have properties. Well, we have properties in, in Boston, Brookline, Salem, Haverhill, uh, Hanover, um, Situate, and uh, we work with uh, several uh, large, uh, some of the regional property management companies very closely, uh, and I know that uh, for here we, you know, we obviously, we haven't gotten to that uh, point because uh, we can't project any of those kind of pieces until we would know uh, whether there's a, an overlay district in, in place here to put forth a project uh, to the city for review, uh, as Mr. May indicated. Um, but we, we, as I said, we work very closely hand in hand with them during the whole lease up process, and then uh, you know at least monthly review uh, every month on how the operations are, any any issues uh, going up. And uh, one of the things we'll also make sure to do here, uh, given the long relationship that the sisters have had with the uh, Brockton Housing Authority, is that we would have. Um, Mr. Uh, Tebow, uh, or the chair, of the, uh, the head of the housing authority, serve uh, one of the three seats on our um, on our board here, so that we know that there is a local contact uh, to make sure that if there is someone that uh, people feel that they need to reach out to, um, they could uh, reach out to him, and we would make sure that information gets through to us. But we uh, have very close oversight of our properties. Well, thank you very much. I know that I did receive a call from Father. Flavin, who's well known in the Brockton community, who's really in support of this and speaks very highly of the different um, your different locations. He told me you had different uh, projects throughout the state, so um, I thank you. Thank you. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Just, I think most of my questions have been answered and they were at the uh, ordinance meeting. I just want to make sure I know 175 units is proposed but over, of course, about 10 years of build-out. Is that correct? That's correct. The sisters uh, still still live very active convent, uh, and I think that they're uh, thinking of you know the the future use there. So uh, certainly, this is to be uh, phased over time with uh, the reuse of their existing property uh, towards the end of it, so that there isn't a, a case of a potential sort of vacant, uh, beautiful, somewhat you know historic building there uh, towards the end. It's their their future thought here. So yes, it's to be phased over time. And. When it was finished, 175 units, what do you propose the mix of bedrooms is? Uh, we, the, the, the current uh, projection is about eight studios. One second. Um, so that whole combination is, uh, just to take a quick step back, is the thought is that the convent uh, building there eventually could be age-restricted housing, 55 or 62 and over. Um, makes a, a great building, great layout for uh, more easily accessible housing. Um, and then some of the other housing would be, uh, could be family housing, but also, uh, you know, could be available to those who are um, older in age too, especially first floor units. But overall, uh, the, the, the information that's been, you know, presented throughout the whole process has been about eight studio apartments, uh, 41 one bedroom, 109 two bedroom, and 17 three bedroom units. In, in your, is that about the same kind of mix you have in most of your other projects, uh, percentage-wise, do you think? Yes, pri primarily uh, one and two bedroom uh, units there, the, certainly uh, a few three bedroom units, uh, particularly for some families, and then studio apartments, uh, you know, have a, a certain uh, market <coughs> and applicability, uh, particularly those are, the studios are primarily in the convent due to its layout at a later point in time. And uh, because I look, and I know the, the concern that seemed to keep popping up was school-aged children 
uh, in your experience, uh, certainly studio would have no children. The one bedroom would have no children, probably. The two bedrooms, how many of those do you generally see as couples, families without, uh, how many of those two bedrooms do you think would have children in them? Uh, so I, I, I don't have a breakdown by sort of bedroom type, but you know, we were looking at this more overall from a potential question in terms of you know, the overall, uh, at the end of the day, right. 10 years down the line, uh, how many you know, children might be uh, living there between let's say the ages of five and 17. Uh, part of that comes from information, uh, as Mr. May alluded to, that's available from DHCD as part of the 40S payment process and calculation. Uh, another part of it is a survey that we uh, do of our properties regularly. Um, and uh, you know, as of this uh, summer too, I think it's fair to say that it's about 25 to 30 percent of the family apartments could be uh, students over time. So we're looking at you know 30 to uh, 30 to 40 potential students, uh, or aged 5 to 17. Um, over the course of that entire period of time based upon those two pieces of data that what DHCD has so far and what's typical of our property portfolio. And if we were to get you to move forward with that commitment of the uh, local preference, they would probably be students we already have. Exactly. That was going to be my next point is that, you know, with, the lo with a local preference there that you're uh, very likely, you know, have, have families that are already living within Brockton uh, moving around so the net new uh, students is uh, relatively minimal and factors into that calculation of 40S Thank uh, you. figures at the end of the, you know, at the end of the year when they do that work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Let, I, I do want to go, Council Fowler, do you want to ask? David, a question, or do, you, or do you want to go to Mr. May first? I know you want to go back. I want to give everybody a fair break, too. Is there anyone else that, Council Deal, are you all set at this point? I'm just, I'm just trying to be fair to every council that's all, asking questions. You all set? Okay. Council Fowle? Yes, uh, Mr. Aiken. What will the demographics be? Low income, affordable housing, market rate? Because that was another issue that was thrown around at the Pliff Academy that this is all low income housing. We're going to have crime. We're going to have all sorts of problems. And Frankly, I don't know what your breakdown was going to be. So define affordable as you implement it and uh, let us know what the, what the percentage break would be. Sure. Do you mind if I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Not Lisa at Albergini, all. to, to speak a little bit too? Not Thank at you. All. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, my name is Lisa Albergini. I'm the president of the Planning Office for Urban Affairs. Um, and we have been working very closely with the sisters on this development that um, may become a project at some time. And in answer to your question, it's a good one. It's a question that does come up. We would be looking, our current plan is to be developing units that would be available to households earning from about 18000 to about $91,000. It's interesting, that's actually considered workforce, and um, most of that is considered affordable housing by the state's definition. Um, the state's definition of affordable housing in this instance, I think, goes up to 68000 or something like that. But the, the important point here is that these are a lot of your coworkers, your colleagues, city employees, um, employees of the school department. And just by way of example, um, we, the target for our, our income targeting that I've just described, um, a junior city clerk um, in Brockton makes 30,700. These are some of the, it's targeted to you know, police officers, teachers, people in the school system employees at Massasoit Community College, police department new recruit 41,000, animal control worker 32,000, school f um, food services employee 37, teacher at one of the schools here 48,000, public school teaching assistants are in the 16, mid 16,000 range up to the low to mid 20,000 range. Special ed departments, you know, um, teachers, substitute teachers, public health workers at the school um, department, um, folks at the at Massasoit, you know, a media support tech is twenty five thousand dollars a year. So, the idea is that in that range, um, from that roughly eighteen thousand to up to about ninety six, ninety seven thousand, <coughs> it's targeted specifically to try to um, help provide um, high quality housing opportunities for city employees, public school um, employees, and folks at Massasoit. When you put in a proposed project like this, and you have people, again, who have robust discussions and concerns. <coughs> Are you amenable to changing the overall dynamics from 175 down? I mean, it, do you have a break-even point where you 
have to have a certain number of units in order to make it financially feasible? And if so, what, what would that yeah. uh, point be? It, it would be early to know that because, again, we haven't had an actual development defined. Um, we can't do that until there's a district that's um, available. We're always in a conversation with the community. I think that if you talk to the folks, um, the municipalities and other cities, you know, Lexington, you know, Haverhill, Boston, you'll see that what I think distinguishes us as a developer is that we are in a conversation with the community. We want, we want to be part of and neighbors to those who live there. Um, and we want our new residents to be welcomed. So we are in, um, often in conversations and we make adjustments in our plans. I can't tell you right now that 152, 152 units would be break even. It really depends a lot on time. The finance, you know, the markets change over time. The financial resources available change over time. So it's a little bit hard now to say it has to be a certain number of units. The development, the district, I think, was defined as up to 175 units. Certainly not over that. Could be less. And you know, as um, David and others here have said, this will be developed over in phases over time. And so, you know, a first phase might be 50 units. Um, and then the next one might be, you know, we, we don't know yet how much, how, how, <coughs> how large each of those would be. So I unfortunately, I can't tell you right now what a break-even number is because that's going to define itself over 10 years. Talk a little bit uh, without too much detail in terms of where these buildings would be, how mm -hmm. far set back from the road, how far would each building be apart, how far from the back lot lines. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think any of us really have a concept as to, I mean, I've seen a sure. picture, but yep. describe it if you would. So let me make a couple of comments and then perhaps turn it over to David for some of the setback information. And I think also, as Mr. May described, there are setback re back requirements as part of the zone you're developing. So we can't do anything other than um, or different from the, um, the definitions identified in the zone that you would be creating. Our um, concept here is not to build, you know, high, mid-rise apartment buildings, but rather to have it be more like a neighborhood and have it be there for townhouse developments, clustered townhouses, um, that where it would be more um, like and fitting in with the neighborhood, more kind of family friendly with front yards, little backyards. Um, and so it's meant to be, you know, three-story townhouses that will be built in different clusters of buildings. Um, as to setbacks, Dave, do you have a sense of the setbacks. I mean, it's all set back off Thatcher Road because yeah. there would be a street coming in. So none of this would be on Thatcher Road. The closest thing to Thatcher Road will, would be, and as it is today, it would remain the convent. Um, and the other buildings are really behind that, brought in through a new road that we would be building. I, I, the reason I ask is I guess my understanding is it's not going to be like, for example, Oak Street in Brockton where 100 feet off of this off of Oak Street, you've got a 11 story oh, or 10 no. story building. No. The, this, this will be, have ample green space. Oh, it, it has ample green space. And again, not only is that what we're planning to build, but it's what you're requiring in the 40 yard district. So we couldn't do anything otherwise anyway, which we think is a good thing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Oh, Chairman. Council, Council Borgard. Well, you want to look at well, I can go back to Council Monahan. Yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. And that workforce housing, <coughs> that's designed so that depending on what their income is, that they do have disposable income. That's how that's set up, just like uh, we're gonna do with the uh, James Digger site. That, that when you have that workforce housing, yeah. that is set up depending on how much their income is, that, that their rent is gonna be low enough so that they have disposable income. Is that correct on we that? We calculate, so there's a rent, uh, um, and the rents range here, I think, from about 700. It will range roughly from $700 to $1,600 a month. You have to have a you know, real income to pay that rent. No, right, yeah. And we define, we set our rents um, so that they are afford, so that people pay about 30% of their income for housing costs. So that, yes, they would have disposable income clearly over and above that. Right, so that's just, that's how I just wanted to get that yeah, right. out there. We're not talking people that don't have disposable income in, in their project or some type of thing like that. No, no. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Council of War, guys. So uh, I'm going to begin with the, uh, with the mention earlier that we would receive 243000 in property tax revenue. We had the fire chief in front of us this summer because not far from this you know, proposal is the Crescent Street um, fire station. And um, it's not at full staff during the summer months because of the budget you know, concerns. So. This uh, 243000 that we received for one year 
would barely keep it open for one month of the summer. So that's a concern. I know it's been mentioned that we can try to do something about addressing people, you know, coming from Broughton. Like I said, we, well, you know, we have affordable housing in Broughton. We have over 1,000 more units than any other community in the Commonwealth. We have the highest rate of affordable housing units in the Commonwealth. And uh, you do allude to different communities, but I think it's important for you to mention all the communities that you, you find yourself in, in. And I know you highlight it, you know, with more attractive communities like Brookline and Boston, which all, you know, a lot of people can't touch. And then it's, it's important to highlight the other communities that you are located in. Affordable housing does alarm people. Uh, one of my first frustrations is you highlighted the 70%. Well, when Trinity Financial came in, they kept on saying they were going to get a lot of Broughton people. First person I met came from Lowell. Now, I'm not against anyone in Lowell, but again, I mean, if we were going to give precedence, it should have you know, been more to Broughton people. So again, I'm, I'm concerned with that. Now, this is supposed to be mixed use, and we have market rate housing within that building that is not, you know, it's not at full capacity. Now, my concerns begin to continue, of course, people have mentioned the concern of traffic, the concern of, you know, the, this breakdown here of uh, the units. As far as students go, what we find with a lot of workforce housing is that there are a lot of individuals, particularly single parents, taking care of two or three kids um, that are usually going to end up in our school system now. Uh, our school system is stretched, so that's one of our concerns, and what we'd like to see certainly is a strong commitment to our school department. Our um, superintendent is extremely concerned about this, and she sent us a letter about you know exercising uh, and emphasizing the concern. And this is one of the, one of the things I'd like to express. We have the fourth largest public school system in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, yet at no time was um, the superintendent or any um, representative from the school department invited to these. I'd like to let people know that these sessions that you had, you had two hearings, they were held at the convent, and um, that's all well and good, you know, it was a very lovely place. But when people think of a public hearing, they think of a public location. And myself, I felt, I mean, I know we've had some Intense topics in this city, and more than once they've been held, let's say, at West Middle School, like, and um, think of one off the top of my head, PowerPoint, where um, it was packed, and that, you know, um, the power plant, and for example. So that's what people mean when they, they mean public hearings. So one of the other concerns, I know that um, everyone is looking for those famous credits. And I know now that they're running out of the funding for them. Now there's word at the State House that they're going to change that and see more funding for developers to apply. But in the interim, one of the also one of the things that concerns me, because we've seen this happen before too, somebody starts building something, oops, the funding runs out, and all of a sudden we have half an operation. So I realize I'm throwing a great deal at you, but there's a couple of things that have concerned me too, and I made them quite clear when I attended all of these meetings. And one of them was, I don't like uh, off-site property management. We have several, whether they, they would call them condos or affordable housing or low-income housing, that the property managers are off-site. And when it comes to addressing, uh, quote, an emergency, end quote, and I think one of the biggest things would be plumbing, flooding, for example, you know, because it was a plumbing problem, there doesn't seem to be anyone quickly responding. And I believe that there's two, how would I say, sides to this. One, they're usually located uh, not nearby, and two, because they've acquired the contract. And two, sometimes, again, I'll put this in quotes, well, uh, those people, um, they, can, they can wait. They're lucky they have a place to live, end quote. And that's you know, often a response that, that transpires. I mean, we have a lot of situations to address here. I mean, this is a, a massive in scope because this is a very serene area. 
and many people associated with the Lithuanian festivals. And that's the only way Co most Council, of them have seen I'm, it. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you just a yes. little bit because I, I, I know you've lost me on what was the first question going well, to be. Well, the first question was, was discussing this response. So I want to just, and, and who, do you, you. who do you want to answer that yes. question? No, I was, I was staying with the urban planning. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that Rob May, the director of planning for the city, was, was behind. Um, but I wanted you know, to go over this a little bit because I feel that that's, that's where the problem has been. A great deal has been left out of the loop and um, people weren't notified of this. And I worry and also get concerned about the history of where you've also done other projects you know, as the, you know, your, your office. So this, this is where okay. I guess I want some, uh, how do I say, some, some things to be cleared up a little bit and sure, define more. Yes. Sure, Councillor, let me um, try to address some of those and I'm not sure I've grasped all of them, but I'll, okay. I'll take a stab at, at them. Um, I think the first thing you mentioned was the size of the tax payment and the cost of running the fire department or the fire station nearby. And I'm sorry, I think Mr. May would be better at, or some others here would be better sure. at, understand okay. the cost of the fire department. I do know the taxes that would be um, paid annually is that amount that we are able to calculate. But yeah. So we know we can help on the revenue side, but probably not the cost side in terms of what that would provide for services um, for the city. Um, these aren't necessarily in the order that you mentioned them. I apologize no, for I that. No, I understand. No, that's fine. Um, on the site, um, I understand entirely the challenges of having um, a housing development with off-site management. Um, we would not have off-site management. We feel very strongly about having very um, high-quality, strict property management um, with very strict standards and high standards. We would have an on-site property manager for the development. Um, and a staff, depending upon, again, where we are in the build-out over time, um, it would be have a non-site property manager, um, some on-site maintenance staff as well, and other kinds of staff. So uh, I would agree with you that having a significant housing development with off-site management only can be problematic, and that's not how we operate our properties. Um, so am I to understand someone would be there 24-7? Well, not 24-7. Um, On-site property management for us use, me usually means um, during the work hours during the day and then on call 24-7, absolutely. Okay, that's, that's yeah. what I was referring to with no. the on call. Right, because absolutely. Because that's we make getting sure someone there in a timely fashion. Sure, we also make sure that the on-call phone number for our property management staff is not only posted on the property, but also available to the police department, the fire department, the neighbors. You know, we want, if there's an issue, we want our property <coughs> management company to know about it and to get after it. So couldn't agree with you more truly on that. Um, you mentioned again the schools and clearly understand, and we've heard the school um, question before, as both Mr. May said and Mr. Aiken said, we have done um, a survey of the schools and of the children, the school age children and our other developments. It happens to be very close to what DHD has also calculated um, in other 40R district developments. And for this, remember there will be a portion of it that would be senior housing in the convent. Um, because it lays out quite nicely um, for that. And we like to have a community that's intergenerational. Um, so that clearly there would not be school children in those units. And of the remaining ones um, with the bedroom mix that we talked about, we would assume that they calculate approximately 35 students in the school system. Again, overall, that's grade ages five through 17. So over all of the grades over the full build out, which will be up to 10 years. And, and of that, as a couple people have pointed out previously, with a target of a 70% local preference, the vast majority of those students would be coming from within the system. And my apologies for the, su the superintendent not being aware of that or not knowing about that. Again, it's a little bit challenging because there's not a project for us to talk about because this is a district that's being discussed. And I think that's part of, sort of part of the kind of miscommunication perhaps. And um, I apologize for that. Um, I think that one of your questions was about perhaps about some of the communities in which we've developed and um, let's see if I have this with me, <laughs> the list of our properties. It sounds like you have a couple in mind that I didn't mention. Mm -hmm. um, we have developed over 2,800 units of uh, senior family and workforce and mixed income housing. I want to say oh, approximately 14 to 1,600 of those are in the city of Boston. And then there are a whole slew of other um, communities that we've developed in. We gave some examples, um, but I'm trying to see in addition to the to the Brooklines and Haverhills and Hanovers, we've developed in um, Lynn. I did develop in Lynn. I know that. I think in Chelsea we have one from a long time ago. North Andover. Um, trying to remember all of them. I don't have that off the top of my head, but I apologize for that. I should know. I don't have a. I don't remember all 32 of the developments over the course of our of our history. 
Bill Ricca. Um, we did, we've developed senior housing in Bill Ricca. So there are a variety of communities across the, um, the Archdiocese of Boston that we have developed in. Uh, that's what I... Okay, thank you. No, because one of, one of, like I said, I had mentioned that this was important to let people know all that what's going on, and Absolutely. I just believe it's, it's vital for individuals to have all of this information accessible to them, because this would be a dramatic change uh, to the area that some people have told me they've lived in for over 50 years. I've even talked to people that, you know, grew up there and then they got married and lived in that community in that area mm -hmm. and had children and now they're grandparents, etc. Sure. And that's, that's very important for a change like that. But I believe that the communication is vital and I believe that was one of our largest frustrations sure. is that people weren't notified in, in a ways that more, more, how would I say, more public and, uh, and also have the information on you available. I think it's important now that you mention to individuals your website and any way that they can contact you. Mm -hmm. because sure. there, there are rather concerns. I'm happy to do Thank that you. right now and give people that information. Also, I just wanted to, to mention one other thing, going back to something that Councilor Farwell, I think, started this off with. Um, and he was right in noting or asking Mr. May, this is the very beginning of a process. This is merely to establish the district, right. but any development that comes forward, any future development would have a whole series of steps and applications and documents and processes and meetings that would be forthcoming. Um, and that would include community meetings and that would include a public hearing. So we're really just at the beginning stages. And then we can speak more specifically about, you know, we'll know then, depending upon the timing, what the financing plan is, what the market is, so we can get much more specific. But um, in terms of, and, and we're happy to establish lines of communication and, you know, figure out the best way to do that through the council um, and your precincts um, with the neighborhood and the abutters directly and also through the various wards. Um, you know, through the counselors and, and, the, and the wards that you represent. Um, our website is www.poua.org. I'm um, sorry, could you, could you say sure, it one I'm sorry. more time? It's www.poua.org. Okay. And that will have the full list of our developments, which I apologize for not remembering all of them tonight. So. Councilor Fowle, did you have an additional question that you wanted to ask her? Or? You want to jump a couple okay. for you, Burke. All right, I just wanted, before we jump, you're all set with her, Council Borgard. Okay, Attorney Burke, if you, if you mind, Council Fowle has a question. I do not mind, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you for being here. I was here. not going to let you slip out without uh, being a part of this. Uh, Thank you, sir. As a lawyer who is licensed in Massachusetts, member of the bar, you've heard certain representations made here tonight about tax payments will be forthcoming. And, and other representations, and uh, as their attorney, I take it you stand behind what you heard, that we, we have accurately presented the information? I'll even go further than that, uh, uh, Council Farwell. Uh, I talked with uh, the client, and I fundamentally, I said, if we go to a public hearing, would you be willing to stipulate that as part of the permit that it will remain a taxable project? And they said, absolutely. So we're happy, uh, the planner is here tonight. Uh, when we get to that stage, we're happy to make it a condition of the approval that the project remain taxable because the reality is, Councilor, <coughs> it's always gonna be taxable. That's the financing structure of this project. Whether it's next year or 35 years from now, it's going to be a taxable project. Uh, and as it relates to the financing, I think, and I congratulate John O'Donnell the assessor's office and Mr. May had requested the information from him. They extensively went through and provided an analysis, which was in fact sent to the city council. Uh, it was part of the, uh, the record that was before the uh, uh, subcommittee's hearing and the ordinance change. And he identified his methodology and how he arrived at the subject and came to the conclusion that in addition to the one-time payments, the city is going to see about $240,000 of real income <coughs> once the project is built out, which is a substantial benefit to the community, in addition to what we see as an exciting project for the, the, uh, the neighborhood. All right, my last uh, question actually is in response to something Council Beauregard raised. My memory is that if you adopt an overlay district, it's approved by the state 
And I think you have to leave it at, at that zoning level for three years, and then they have to approve changing it. Have I read the statute properly? So it's not, it's not a question of we adopt the district, but then we decide to do something else with it. I think once DHCD approves that district, we have to go back to them if we want to change the zoning within that district. Am I, am I correct? That is also my understanding, uh, Councillor. Uh, but I, I would suggest that, uh, candidly, this permitting process is going to be a multi-year process aside from the build-out process. So uh, the neighborhood, uh, the community, uh, the citizens of that area, many of whom I've represented, are going to have a full opportunity uh, to discuss the project provide input and the permitting process will be taking us down a road that's going to be a good journey thank you thank you mr thank chairman you. Also to councilor is there um any other questions uh i'll make a just a, a quick comment i um i i believe and firmly believe that um <clears throat> you know what is before us is, as we mentioned it is, is the acceptance of the overlay uh, district and 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 the growth planning uh to take place of uh, Thatcher Street. And, and I think um, as one who lived on the <coughs> east side of Brockton for a good many years and represented the uh, good parents and children of, uh, of Ward 5 down there as the school committee representative for a long time, um, I don't think in any way that the uh, sisters would lead us down the, a, a wrong path of what they're trying to do, to be truthful with you. I think they've, uh, they've come to the point um, in, in their life where they want to make sure that um, you know the, the property is taken care of in, in such a great way that Brockton's going to benefit from it, and I think that's what's most important, um, as we've as we've just discussed, of of it being definitely always being on the tax roll, and I think that's what's most important, and that's what they want, and uh, um, and I think the second thing is that it, it's still got to go through many many different phases. So, um, you know, that being said, um, you know, I, I I thank them for coming up with the with this idea, which I don't think they thought of overnight. Maybe it did sisters, I don't know, but I, I think um, I, I truly believe that. Um, you know what uh, what's in store for for the future down there is is it's going to be very bright so with that being said anything else? Second. motion's been made and, and second that we send this back to the uh, full city council all in favor opposed this item goes back to the full city council and will be heard at our next uh, council meeting next uh, monday evening thank you uh, thank you all for for coming thank you sisters as well appreciate it Councils, I do want to thank uh, Councilor Yaneri, the Dean of the Council, for stepping in. As you know, I've recused myself from any matters relative to the uh, agenda item number seven, Thatcher Street. Uh, we will go on to agenda item eight. However, I do want to read into the record a couple uh, correspondences that we have received. And I'm going to do it in the order that they were received, if I could. And I believe, Councils, you received them as well. But I think what we'll do, first of all, is, um, yeah, I'll read, the, I'll, read the, I'll read the correspondences first. Councilors, uh, the form, form of an email was sent uh, Friday, October 13th at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Dear Council President Sullivan, this morning the Chief Financial Officer and I received the agenda for the Finance Committee of Monday, October 16th, on which appeared four separate orders to allow the purchase and financing of Aquaria, along with a list of invitees to the meeting for the agenda items. After conferring, we are writing to respectfully request a postponement for the following reasons. The order to authorize the purchase was drafted as a single entity by Richard Manley of Lock Lord, the city's bond council. The order on the agenda has been broken into four separate orders. The city would like the courtesy of conferring with attorney Manley after the, about the implications of this. We don't believe that receiving notice on Friday morning for an agenda on Monday night affords enough time to do this. Some of the invited guests will not have received the invitation in time to schedule an appearance. This is almost certainly true of Moses Parenti of Aquaria, who resides in Mexico. Even if these people do receive the invitation before Monday, it may not be possible to arrange their attendance. This is especially true for those who are out of the country. Some of the people who ought to be invited do not appear on the list. For example, Marta Verde, the chief executive at Anima, the firm which owns Aquaria, actively directed her firm's participation in negotiations, and she has indicated that when this item comes before the council, she would like to come from Madrid to participate. 
The president's schedule does not permit that. Aquaria during negotiations was represented not only by in-house counsel, Amelia Robes from Madrid, but also by Jose Moran of the Chicago Office of the International Law Firm of Mackenzie Baker and some of his associates from Toronto, Canada office. Aquarius should be afforded the opportunity to determine which of these attorneys should attend the Finance Committee meeting. The president's schedule doesn't permit that. Andrew Cohn of Wilmer Hale had no role in the negotiations, nor did his firm, so he should not be invited. The city was represented in negotiations by attorneys, attorneys Matthew McTeague and David Rogers, both also of Lork Laud, and both of them are extensively experienced in asset purchase valuations and terms. It is essential that the City Council hear their perspective in reaching a decision on this uh, proposal. We cannot guarantee their participation on Monday night with a short notice. We also received important participation from our consulting engineering firm, Camp Dress and McKee Smith. The views of these professionals ought to be made available to the councilors, and we also cannot guarantee their attendance on Monday on such short notice. Over the months of May, June, and July, the Chief Financial Officer and the members of his staff spent a great deal of time assisting the finance executives of firms who are members of the Chamber of Commerce who serve on a task force of the Chamber for the special project of reviewing the, analysis that, the analysis that the city made in reaching its recommendation to purchase the plant. This was an extensive effort, and we guarantee, I'm sorry, we believe that the Chamber be afforded an opportunity to present its results. Accordingly, we respectfully request that the item be post the items, plural, be postponed on Monday to the evening of Wednesday, November 8th. Our expectation is that the Council will not wish to meet on Monday, November 6th in advance of Tuesday's election. In addition, we suggest that you schedule a Finance uh, Committee meeting um, for Monday, October 30th with an agenda item to hear the Chamber's presentations in advance of the actual purchase action. If instead it is your desire to hold the Finance Committee meeting recommending action on this proposed purchase before the end of, end of October, the ske then schedule a Finance Committee meeting for Monday, October 30th as a date both for the postponement of the present agenda items and the date to hear from the Chamber. This at least will give all of us the opportunity to have the proper people in attendance e either approach Either approach to scheduling also allows time for a second and third reading should there be sufficient votes before the current council authority expires. Finally, the chief financial officer wasn't, officer wasn't invited. He trusts that this was just a mere oversight. Oswald Jordan, the chairman of the Water Commission, also wasn't invited, but he should be. We sincerely hope that you hear our concerns on the present schedule and adopt our request to reschedule so that, so that this very important matter receives the necessary informed deliberation. We can supply the clerk to the committee with the addresses of the individuals we believe should be attend respectfully. Philip Nazarella, of course, is the city solicitor, and John Connor is the CFO. Uh, we do want to put that into the record. Councilors, I just want to be clear about this. As, as chairman of the Finance Committee and Council President, I nor any members of the City Council came up with those invited guests. I mean, those were the names that were provided to us. Um, so I just want to make that clear. I also want to make it clear that we are not, I will not call a special meeting on October 30th. So. Uh, we can wipe that off the off the plate. That's not going to happen. It's the fifth Monday, and we're not going to do that. Um, I do have two other letters, if I could read into the record. Again, this one was Monday uh, today at 12:19 p.m., um, and it's from Martha DePriest, former assistant to Andrew Cohn, uh, Wilmer Hale, uh, 60 State Street in, in Boston. This office received a letter from the City of Brockton's Auditor's Department regarding a meeting tonight concerning the City of Brockton and Aquaria LLC. Please be advised that Andrew H. Cohn, to whom the letter was addressed, has retired from Wilma Hale, and that, and that firm no longer represents Aquaria Nima, Anima in this matter. I apologize for the lateness in informing you of this matter. I was out of the office last week when the letter arrived. Thank you. And the last one that I'd like to read in the record is from the mayor. Again, it was sent today at 1.02 p.m. from Bill Carpenter. Dear Council President Sullivan, I am writing to formally request a postponement of the agenda items on tonight's Finance Committee having to do with the proposed Aquaria purchase. These agenda items are 8 through 11. The, request, the reason for the request is that the agenda items as posted do not agree with the form and substance of the request I submitted to City Council on April 10th. A quick review of the agenda by the City's Bond Council has revealed that some of these differences may render the orders as posted as deficient. For example, none of the orders on the agenda provide the City with the authority to borrow the funds. This deficiency alone would be fatal and it is not the only possible deficiency. In order that the City Council the City Solicitor, the Legislative Council, and City Bond Council may have the opportunity to work through these problems in an organized fashion. I request this postponement. I do, do not believe that the necessary clarifications need to take much time, but they do need to happen. Once that has happened, I stand ready to attend a properly posted Finance Committee meeting at any future date 
and to bring my team to that meeting to present and answer questions. In the meantime, I have instructed them not to speak on the relevant agenda items tonight. Respectfully, yours, Bill Cop and the Mayor of the City of Brockton. We'll put that into the record as well. Madam Clerk, if you could please read uh, agenda item eight. Councilor. Just, just as a point of order, a point of information, uh, I'm not quite sure why I understand the objection because there are separate orders. There is an order, number 204, dated May 8, 2017, uh, asking us to authorize the mayor to deliver the asset purchase agreement pursuant to the sale. There's another order that we are being asked to grant an exemption to any and all employees who might work at the plant if we were to, to acquire it from residency requirements. Those were signed by Councilor Stadensky. And lastly, there is an order asking us to uh, pass a home rule petition for enabling legislation to do various issues that they, the administration thinks is important. And actually, item nine in the agenda is that the sum of 78 million is appropriated to pay costs of purchasing the Aquaria water desalination facility. So I'm, I'm a bit confused, but let me say this. If this goes forward at some future point, Let's check with the clerk. Let's check with our legislative council and make sure. If we've done something wrong, I'll be the first to admit it. But it seems to me we have separate documents in front of us, all of which would merit a discussion and a vote. And if I've missed something, I hope someone will correct that. Thank you, Council. And I do concur. And again, just a piece of information. These agenda items had been generated previously. As you recall, we postponed this matter prior to the beginning of the summer with the hope that we would have MWRA in, which Council Fowell and I did, and that there was gonna be some time to vet it out. So again, I'm, I'm a little stupefied myself, but we have uh, always served in a professional manner, and we have been requested by uh, what documentations were just read into the record. So um, we will go through the process relative to having the clerk uh, read number eight, please. Mr. Chairman. Councilor. I, back in the spring, I had also requested when the sale of Aquaria came up and a lot of concerns from the community uh, questioned a lot of, um, had many questions. I had requested a, a public hearing and I know at the time, Legislative Council, um, uh, Mark Gilday, uh, Judge Gilday, had, uh, we had spoken about it briefly, so I want to keep that, I don't know what we can do now as far as scheduling it before the end of the year but I really, I, I think the community needs to have a public hearing on Aquaria. Well, I think uh, because again, uh, Mark Gilday, who has served us for over 30 right. years, is now a judge, um, and attorney Shannon Resnick has, has filled the Legislative Council so, position, so we can talk to attorney Resnick on that request, Councilor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilor. I'm sorry to belabor the point, but in, in uh, response to my colleague, what I would say to Mr. Condon and the city solicitor, I don't think it's up to us to sell this, this order or these orders. To me, the person who should be making the presentation to the community should be the mayor and the chief financial officer and the DPW commissioner. I mean, we're part-time counselors. I have voluminous materials at home. We've just received the materials tonight, which update some of the issues. Uh, frankly, I don't feel that well equipped to go out and answer all of the questions from the public. Uh, neither am I. I believe the original request that I had made is to be able to have professionals from both sides to answer the questions of the public. I'm in no place to answer well, them I, either, and I don't. And, and just in, is there anything on the floor right now? There is not anything on the floor right now, Councillor. Um, we, we can get to that, but as the chair, I'm going to ask that number eight be read into the record, please. Madam Clerk, please read number eight. Order an act authorizing the city of Brockton to appropriate funds to acquire a desalization plant located in the town of Dighton together with any and all related water transmission facilities authorizing the city to borrow all or any portion of such appropriation authorizing the city to enter into an asset purchase <coughs> agreement and such other agreements as such as shall be necessary and convenient to the acquisition of such plant and facilities and providing for the transfer of all related permits, licenses, and regulatory approvals previously granted by any agency or department of the Commonwealth. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Larry Rowley, Commissioner, Department of Public Works, Moses Parente, General Manager, Aquaria Water, LLC, Philip C. Nasralla and our designee city solicitor, Martin S. Brophy, treasurer, Andrew 
H. Cohen, Wilmer Carter Cutler, Pickering, Hale and Door, LLP, Catherine M. Federoff, Mead, Tallerman, and Costa, LLC. Thank you for reading that, Madam Clerk. Council, is the will of the uh, committee, we can either uh, go agenda item by agenda item or we could. Chairman, I make a motion that we take items 8, 9, 10, and 11, and since they're all lengthy but all relate to the same issue, that we dispense with the reading and that we postpone till the next finance meeting. Okay. Trying to check council to see if they're all the same invited guests. I believe they are. I looked at that. Council, there's a motion on the floor to uh, take agenda item. First of all, to waive the reading on 9, 10, and 11 of the agenda items um, and to take 8, 9, 10, 11 collectively, correct? Collectively, Collectively. postpone until the next finance meeting. So we'll take it in two forms. There's a motion to take 8, 9, 10, 11 collectively. All in favor of taking them collectively, please raise your hand. Please, let's put them up high if you're going to take them collectively. All opposed? All right, it passes collectively. And now the next uh, motion made by Council Cruz, and it was seconded by Council Azak is to postpone agenda items 8, 9, 10, and 11, taken collectively, postpone them to the next regularly called Finance Committee meeting. Mr. Chairman. Counselor. I've forgotten, is this, is a motion to postpone debatable? I should know this and I don't. I can entertain a discussion before we take the vote, Counselor. I, I, I would just but say to my colleagues, I'm, I'm looking more to table this. I'm looking to kill it. I think it's. I think we've spent enough time in this, and uh, we're getting towards the end of the year. If the uh, administration wants to go out and sell this concept to the city, and hold public meetings and present the information, because the sales job hasn't been done yet from all of the calls I've gotten, so they want to reintroduce it after the next legislative session begins. So be it. But I would hope the motion to postpone is defeated, and we could have a motion to table. So motion on the floor is properly second to postpone agenda item 8, 9, 10, 11 until the next called FinCom meeting. All in favor of that, please raise your hand. All opposed? Motion fails. Entertain another motion. Move the table 8, 9, second. 10, 11. So motion on the floor and under Robert's rules to table. It was properly second. There can be no discussion on that. It was tabled on a motion 8, 9, 10, 11. All in favor of tabling 8, 9, 10, 11, please raise your hand. All opposed? Matters tabled. 8, 9, 10, 11 is tabled. Mr. Chair. Counselor. Could we read um, for the record 9, 10, and 11 so that. Counselor, we can. Oh. It was waived. Okay, thank you. All it was right, waived, you. Counselor. Okay, the minutes were reflected. It was waived. However, the agenda minutes will be deemed as a public, uh, public document. And if anybody's interested in the actual verbiage, they could see it as such. Uh, with that being said, counselors, we're going to go on to agenda item number 12. And I do want to recognize, actually, uh, a former colleague here in the city council and also state representative Fran Mayer is here. Thank you for being here tonight, Fran. And, of course, our, our, our friend DA uh, Timothy Cruz is here as well. Um, could we read uh, number 12, please? Resolve to invite Timothy Cruz to appear before a committee of this council to update the committee on current crime rates, the Safe Streets Collaborative, and the current state of cooperation between the many public safety partners currently active in the city of Brockton, including all state and federal agencies, to also enlighten the council on any other issues that may be of interest to this council. Invited, Timothy J. Cruz, District Attorney, Plymouth County. Mr. Chairman, well, Mr. Cruz comes up. I just, I filed this uh, after some conversations with the District Attorney, such, such a well-named District Attorney, Timothy <laughs> J. Cruz. And uh, it, I, we both felt that uh, a lot of the feedback we get from our constituents is that the public doesn't, isn't really aware of all the different things that the DA's office is doing to coordinate crime fighting in, in the Brockton area and in, in all of Plymouth County. And again, since so much, I say Plymouth County, and it's important because uh, crime doesn't know any, knows no borders. And uh, so I, I asked the district attorney and after our conversations if he could come in and, 
answer, give us a, a kind of an outline of who's working here, what they're doing, and what other operations the DA's office is doing, and to answer any questions we might have. So. Thank you. And Council, I want to thank you, and I do want to thank the DA, and I also want to recognize a good Brockton resident, Brockton High grad, former judge Rick Savignano, who now works for Plymouth County DA's office, and Rick is here as well. But with that being said, DA Cruz, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, Mr. Chairman and uh, Councilors. Uh, it's great to be here tonight uh, to talk to you a little bit about what's been going on in the office. And as you probably know, most of you know, and I think some of you may have been there at the opening of our office over at 166 Main Street, that was probably the biggest thing that was going on for an extensive period of time. It took an incredibly long period of time to move from our location where we had been for more than 35, 40 years over at 32 Belmont from a building that we had outgrown and also that was really in significant disrepair. So after, you know, it, it was only because of a lot of really good people working really hard, legislators, yourselves, people putting themselves out there, making sure we get the appropriate funding. It actually took us probably more than a decade to get the funding and to move to a really state-of-the-art facility. And what it allowed us to do was to move 32 Belmont Street, and we also had uh, an office at the annex, we called it, but it was on Main Street, right across the road from 32 Belmont, as well as a forensic computer lab down in Plymouth. And I think perhaps most importantly, move uh, the state police assigned to the district attorney's office uh, to downtown Brockton from Middleborough. So that now, we've been there now for roughly uh, four or five months now, I think it is. Uh, the troopers have been there, and for those of you that don't know, there are 24 troopers that work for the Plymouth County DA's office who are specifically assigned to work in conjunction with the local uh, police departments in our county, here in the city of Brockton. There's a great relationship between, I think, the troopers as well as the city of Brockton police officers who do a tremendous job uh, at all times, and I, I just really want to thank everybody for their efforts in helping us getting the funding and move to a building that really I think is, if, and if you haven't been there, please stop by uh, and, and check it out because it's really such a big difference. The last press conference we did at our office was at the old office at 32 Belmont. There was water pouring in. We had a big bucket in the middle of the, of the, uh, uh, the hearing, and people were asking me, like, this is the DA's office? And my response was not for long. And, and because of your efforts, I'm, I'm very helpful, ha thankful for that. Uh, and as you also noted, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have also uh, recently, uh, my first assistant uh, district attorney, much like uh, Judge Gilday, my first assistant, Sharon Donatelli, became a Superior Court judge also. So uh, as a result of that, there was an opening in our office for the head manager in our office to, to have somebody come in that can make a determination and help us and help me lead the office uh, as we proceed in these incredibly challenging times. And uh, I think that I was very lucky uh, and, and the, the county was lucky getting uh, Judge Savignano, Rick Savignano, uh, to come back to our office and to make sure that, you know, we could have somebody from the city be in the city, somebody that understands the issues, somebody who sat on the bench. For those of you that don't know Rick, he had been, um, you, you know, in the private practice. He had been in the DA's office back when I started, back in the mid-'80s. Uh, and he also then went to the Attorney General's office, the U.S. Attorney's office, back to the DA's office. Then he was a judge for 21 years. And I think we were really fortunate uh, to have him and make sure that uh, he can continue on with his leadership role, mentoring really the 60-some-odd lawyers we have in our office who do a tremendous job working in conjunction with everybody in our, in our, in our office. Um, probably, as you know, the traditional role of the district attorney has changed and developed quite a bit over the years. Uh, we're no longer just the county prosecutor. We're no longer just people standing up uh, for the rights of victims in our community. Um, and we continue to, to fight the fight uh, at all various levels, and including right here in the city where there's been some real challenges uh, with a lot of the, the, the gun issues, uh, there's been real challenges with the, the opioid problems that are going on right now, and what we see and what our numbers show us is that a lot of people are coming from outside the city to come in here and purchase their drugs and they use their drugs here. And what we end up finding is that more than half of the individuals who are taken to either Good Sam or to the Brockton Hospital who overdose, they're not from Brockton. They're coming here from, from other portions of our county and other portions of our area. So we need to, once again, continue to work and try to get, deal with this opiate crisis. But I think that, you know, I think just recently in the newspaper they were talking about the FBI releasing statistical data showing numbers that were down. And our numbers show the same thing. And then in 2016, the firearm-related incidents in the city were down 23% from 2015, 11% from 2014, and also 28% for 2013. So overall, firearm-related incidents were down 21% on a three-year three average. Um, but still, there's, there's too much. And, and I think that you know, when we continue to work with 
uh, not just the state police and the local police, but we also work with our federal partners. We work with the Department of Justice. We work with DEA, FBI, ATF. We work with parole. And we're, we, once again, within the last couple of years, put together Operation Safe Streets, which really is a derivative of one of the old federal programs that we had here in Brockton. If you recall, remember we had Weed and Seed probably 10, 12 years or so ago, and then Weed and Seed kind of morphed into Project Safe Neighborhood, which was dealing with guns and drugs and violence in the community. Those federal grants all expired in 2009, and there was nothing new for an extended period of time. Uh, so without any funding, we put Safe Streets back together in, I think it was June of 2015, once again, sitting at the table with all of our different partners, and quite honestly, it's really uh, been one of the more effective things we've been able to do by that sharing of information, I think, has led to a lot of the good things that happen here. The, the coordination, the partnership, the communication between the agencies, um, the successful prosecutions of the high-impact defendants, and the proactive criminal enforcement of a lot of the sweeps that go on. Uh, trying to get the violent recidivists who continue to create havoc in our community and focus on the individuals who are committing, the small group of individuals who are committing the vast majority of the crime. And that's one of the issues that we continue to deal with. Safe Street continues to meet every other month, some are excluded. Uh, we have our next meeting at the Unknown School. Uh, it'll be, uh, it's, it's usually starts, I believe, at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Uh, we always get it out as much as we can, whether it be on Twitter or in the newspaper, so people can know and, be, and air their concerns. Communication with the people in our community, I believe, is something that is really something that's incredibly important. And I love going to the Safe Street meetings when people come in, and quite honestly, they're complaining about a light out on their street. Because they're not there because of the fact there's not a heck of a lot going on for violent crime, up and down. I mean, it comes and it goes. But I think with the great work that's being done here, uh, I think it's made a lot of real ch uh, air, uh, a better place for us. We continue to work with the opiate crisis that's going on right now. We try to get out more, be more preventative. We work, we have developed the Plymouth County Drug Abuse Task Force two years back. We continue to work with the, the Plymouth County Outreach, which is a program that was developed down in Plymouth and now is expended to all 26 communities and the city of Brockton, of which for every non-fatal overdose within 12 to 24 hours after that, a police officer and either a licensed counselor or a te technician will go to somebody's home and bring them information. And also at the same time, Plymouth County Hope, which is a version of EB Hope of the drop-in centers. People that can go to our various spots here in the county and get help for the people that, that need to get help. I think that you know we continue to track the overdose numbers that we have here in our community, trying to make sure we can get in front of the terrible scourge that's out there. And I think that you know, right, pretty much right now, uh, our numbers are flat. They continue the same, our, our drug overdoses are fatal and are non-fatal here in Plymouth County so far this year, up through yesterday anyway, we had approximately 1,200 overdoses, of which 113 were fatal. So the good news is, is that the Narcan that's been provided to the EMTs and the first responders and the police and the firefighters, they've saved hundreds of people with Narcan. And I think that's a positive thing. And working with that in conjunction with the drug courts that are happening now, we have four district courts here in Plymouth County. And in Brockton, Plymouth, and Hingham, we have drug courts. And also, they kind of morph into mental health places where we can get information, people get the, uh, the, the things that they need to get. So we continue to look out for grants. And what can we do to try to better ourselves to continue onward? And I'll tell you, federally, it's been very difficult over the last few years because there's been nothing there. We've applied for the most recent uh, Project Safe Neighborhood grant. Um, we were, uh, the, they're only going to give one in Massachusetts, and we just found out last week that Plymouth County is getting the Project Safe Neighborhood grant, and what that consists of um, is, is $450,000 over two years. Uh, the grant is for Brockton because Brockton is the, the community of, of record. Of, is more, it's it's going to be a certain size when we go after grants. It's going to be more than 75,000 people. Brockton is the only community that really fits that in our, in our county. This money is going to go for uh, the Brockton police and state police over time. It will help in both of those instances. It's also going to help for more surveillance cameras, trainings for law enforcement and prosecutors, and community landlord and tenant trainings. And there's also going to be money for neighborhood association, train the trainer associations. It's going to help and increase our capacity to hold the violent offenders accountable, to expedite the gun and the drug trafficking prosecutions and refer the cases to the U.S. Attorney's Office to get the people who are committing the most serious crimes referred federally where they're going to get some real time. And also at the same time, it's going to provide opportunities for those people who are formerly incarcerated upon their reentry and programs like that in our community. 
as a lot of you know, we invest quite a bit back here, not just in this, in this city, but also throughout the whole county. We have our community reinvestment program where we take our drug forfeited funds, we turn it right back into our community, uh, and it allows us to donate a portion to nonprofit groups who offer drug rehab, education, and other anti-drug neighborhood programs. We spend these monies on our triad programs, our seniors and law enforcement working together, our safety events for our seniors, our annual summer dare camp, uh, small community groups get like kids road races here in Brockton. Every year we sponsor Dave Gorman at the DW Park, getting him the monies for the kids road races. Uh, graduation night parties, senior lock-ins where on graduation, some schools want to keep their kids when they graduate in the afternoon, put them inside their school so they can watch them that night because lots of things, people want to have a good time, but knowing where your kids are I think is also a good thing. Uh, we continue to sponsor Edgar Park movie nights, uh, night out against crime, uh, and we also use some of that money for forensic analysis equipment that we can use as state police. Um, I, I also just wanted to give, uh, if you don't mind, if I could just give a couple of my minutes to Rick Savignano. Rick wanted to address a couple of things with the counselor, and then at that point, um, if you have any questions, we'll answer them as best as we can. Thank, Thank you, you, DA. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. A lot of friendly and familiar faces. It's nice to be here tonight, and I appreciate the invitation. I won't be long. I know it's been a long night. I will say it's great to be back. Um, uh, Tim mentioned I was uh, on the bench for 21 years. My kids point out that I rarely sit still for 21 minutes, so uh, that time went by very fast, and it's great to be back at the DA's office. Uh, in the DA's office, as Tim pointed out, uh, and I do, I urge you again to come by and see us. I think you'd be very impressed with the operation, and if you do, please ask for me. I'll make sure you get a look at the building and can take a good look around while you're there. We have 65 attorneys. Um, we operate uh, in five different courts. We have the Superior Court, of course, here in Brockton, and then the four district courts, Brockton, Weymouth, Plymouth, uh, and Hingham. We have close to 62 attorneys on staff, 24 state police officers work in our unit. And we undertake a number of initiatives and a number of priorities in our office. Uh, the DA has talked to you about a lot of the initiatives that we engage in here in the community. I know those firsthand uh, as someone who's raised three children in this community who've all gone through Brockton Public Schools, one through 12, uh, who've all been actively involved in the community. Um, as a lifelong resident, I know the impact that these programs can have in the community, in our neighborhoods. Uh, I was a DA 35 years ago. The job's a lot different now. We engage in a lot of preventative programs, a lot of proactive programs. Uh, and I won't reiterate what the district attorney has said, but it's a far more comprehensive and, and uh, 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 far-reaching responsibility that we have today than, than at any other time in the past. And it reaps benefits, it reaps rewards. Uh, in addition, however, of course, uh, our core function is the prosecution of criminal cases. And in our office, obviously, we focus on a broad range of those, um, whether it's uh, the opi uh, opiate trafficking, fentanyl trafficking, human trafficking, which is a, a, a crime of a staggering proportion in terms of the statistics, uh, motor vehicle homicides, um, arson cases, whatever it may be, uh, our office is involved from initiation of the case at arraignment uh, through its prosecution and then even through appeal uh, should that be pursued. Um, we're probably, I won't even qualify it, we are the largest law firm in southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, we're a very far-ranging uh, operation. Uh, you would be impressed to, uh, to see the range of issues that we deal with on a daily basis, uh, whether it's public records requests, whether it's uh, first-degree murder prosecutions. It is a far-reaching and complex uh, practice that we engage in, and I can say that uh, I'm proud to say that the 65 lawyers that I have the privilege of working with every day are the finest group of prosecutors I've ever worked with. And I've been in the DA's office, I've been in the Attorney General's office, and I was a federal prosecutor. This is the finest group of prosecutors and professionals that I've ever been associated with, uh, and I'm uh, thrilled to be back. Um, that's pretty much a, a quick over, overview of it. I'm happy to answer any questions, but more, more than that, should you have any questions at any future time or require any follow-up from our office, call me. You can call me at the district attorney's office. I'm always there. Uh, and if I'm not there, I'm right up the street. I'm right here in Brockton. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them or to yield back to the district attorney. and Con Council Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, uh, I, I should have mentioned uh, before, in 
in full disclosure, my wife works in the DA's office, so it is something we get to have uh, a lot of conversations about, and the work that they do is is key to what happens in the city. And I will say that Judge Savignano and uh, DA Cruz, when they started 35 years ago, they both had full head of hair. So. I don't know which. A little thinner, too. A little thinner, <laughs> but um, I will turn it over to, uh, to uh, my other colleagues. But just another point on something that we talked about earlier tonight, the workforce housing, if we were to move forward, people would be amazed. I think you, can you tell me uh, what a, f a starting assistant DA makes for a salary? Uh, now they make $46,000 a year, and that's only after pushing of really for the last number of years. When I first started back as DA 16 years ago, they were making about 32, 33,000. Um, and what, what we end up, hap what happens to us, we end up losing a lot of really good lawyers. They will go to other state agencies because they pay at council one level, which is at 55,000. So we lose people to the Department of Revenue or DCF or other places where they're gonna make more money. And I mean, you certainly can't blame them. I mean, it's not really a living wage, especially when you owe thousands and thousands of dollars for your college and your law school. So we, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge keeping good people because you do get high rate of turnover. I mean, I left uh, after four years when I first started there because I couldn't afford to stay. So I will turn it over to my colleagues, but I just thought that was telling with what we talked about with the workforce housing earlier. Thank so. you, Councilor. Councilor Fowell, please. Just one question for either Judge Savignano or District Attorney Cruz. Um, Many people feel as though the courts don't treat offenses seriously. Now, I realize you need an independent judiciary, and I realize the judges have wide discretion. But I guess what I'd like to know is, behind the scenes, Judge Savignano, do you ever get a chance to go in and give someone a dope slap and say, hey, let's, <laughs> let's, let's take this seriously. You know, we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time and effort, and we're bringing these people in, and it seems like it's a revolving door. When I sat at the Brockton District Court, and I was a Brockton District Court judge uh, throughout my tenure, and I sat on the Brockton District Court for 14 or 15 years, the biggest distinction between judges wasn't so much philosophy or ideology. It was where you went home at night. And when I would go home at night, I would go about a mile and a half or a mile from the courthouse, and my kids would be in Brockton schools and my kids would play in Brockton playgrounds. Uh, and my uh, entire family, and my wife's on my dad, who's born and raised in Brockton, lived here her whole life. We understood and appreciated the impact that a court and judicial decisions can have on a community. And I think that's oftentimes overlooked. Um, I can't speak for my former colleagues as judges, but it's difficult uh, to rationalize some of the decisions that are made. Uh, and I think the best explanation is, if you understand a community, if you appreciate how a court's actions, how a judge's rulings impact the quality of life in a community, uh, you have a better appreciation uh, for what's right and wrong and, and, and how to deal with serious criminals who, 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 who commit serious criminal offenses. Um, there wasn't a day that I sat on the bench in Brockton or anywhere where I didn't uh, put as it, it, at the forefront of my mind the impact that this crime would have on the community, on the good folks that are trying to just send their kids to school, uh, who are trying to live peacefully in their own communities. Uh, and um, so that always influenced what I did as a judge. Uh, I have to think that, that judges who, when they left the Brockton court or any court and drove some distance away to a community unconnected to Brockton, that that might influence their decisions. I can't say that for sure. But I can certainly say that it influenced my decisions, you know, well, knowing the, the impact that it had on a community. Just in closing, the late Judge Andrew Dooley, who started off as clerk magistrate, Andy rode around with the cops Yes, at he night. did. And so he saw firsthand exactly what domestic violence might do to the kids in the house, not just to the victim. And he would see what drunken driving would do to someone who ended up in the hospital with life-threatening injuries. And I sometimes think, very respectfully, if some of the judges had a ride along with some of the police throughout this state and got a first-hand view of exactly what goes on, what the officers have to do, what it takes to put together a case, uh, I think they'd have a better understanding of just how the enormity of the, the challenge that's before them to make sure that a case is treated appropriately. 
you can sometimes tell if someone des deserves a break, but you can also tell when you just know that person is going to be back in before you in the next three or six months, and I'm sure you've seen it. Councilor Farwell, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you just suggested. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chief. you, Councilor. Any other questions, Councilors? Uh, first of all, I just want to say, and I've said this many times, we're very, very fortunate, Councilors, that DA Cruz has decided to have the DA office here in the city of Brockton. He's not mandated to do that. He could put it anywhere in Plymouth County. So we do thank you. And uh, I mean, I used to intern with Bill O'Malley, and I know when those buckets were getting filled with water, that place was, was terrible. So um, kudos to your diligence and dedication. I know it was a collaborative approach. But uh, I also want to say, counselors, when I was a lawyer at the State House, I was able to sit in at the Sheriff's Office with DA Cruz on the uh, Drug Task Force. And uh, I will say Tim rolls up his sleeves. And he might have the elected title as DA, but uh, he, he, you know, he, he cares about the community. And uh, I, I just want to say thank you for having Rick Savignano on board as well, because uh, they can say it's a dream team right here. And Brockton and the surrounding communities will benefit. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here tonight. Thank, thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. Moses. Council Rodriguez, please. Just a quick question, uh, DA Cruz. Uh, when you mentioned about the 24 to 25 troopers that you have in, the, uh, in Brockton, yep. are they for the city of Brockton or for Plymouth County? They're for Plymouth County. Okay. So in, in terms of a ratio, what I'm looking at is additional boots on the ground in the sense. Yeah. Uh, on an average, how many how many police officers, how many troopers do we actually have in Brockton? Uh, well, they 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 come every day to to our office. So for the visibility and presence, they're here when they're whenever their shift to going go is going on. So they come to our office. They park their cars there. Uh, they're out and about. But their role and their duties and responsibilities have remained the same. But quite honestly, a lot of their work is done right here in the city. A lot of the warrants and search warrants and arrest warrants and working with the locals and the meetings that are going on right now are bringing more and more law enforcement to our community every day versus going down to Middleborough, which is uh, right off of Route 28 uh, down in that neck of the woods. So although they're, they're working with the Brockton police officers and all of our local POs, uh, they're, they're, they're in a position where they're going to be here in the city. And I think visibility and presence is a really big thing. Are they in in mark cruisers or most of them in unmarked or they are they're virtually all unmarked they're all undercover uh, troopers however uh, trust me when I say this the bad guys know what cars they who cars they're driving they know what cars all the police are driving whether it be their personal cars or their work cars and they know very well when they see the Ford Tauruses up around our building that they're all they're all troopers okay uh, you I don't think you actually mentioned when you're talking about the safe street uh, Safe Streets uh, Collaborative. Yeah, you didn't quite go into the partners that you have on a on a on a monthly basis that come down for a meeting. Uh, I had been to a couple of those in the past. Uh, could you just take a couple seconds and just kind of tell us who are the partners? Sure, the, the the partners, and it's actually expanded quite a bit. Quite honestly, what's what's going on is that because I've assigned um, a, a gentleman from our office now is in charge of running safe streets and he used to be a Suffolk County assistant DA and he's really got really good ties with the Boston police. We find out a lot of the issues that are going on here in the city, there's, there's relation, relationships between Boston and Brockton. So these communications are incredibly important. So with the meetings that we have in our office, you're going to have uh, Boston police, Boston detectives, you're going to have the Federal Bureau of Investigation, DEA, ATF, parole, state police, local police all working together and coming in and talking about the people who are causing the problems in the city. And once again, focusing on the individuals who are committing the vast majority of the crime. And it really is a small group of individuals who ruin places for everybody. And that's why it's really important to continue to work with them together, exchange that information. And I'm really hopeful now that we just got this Project Safe Neighborhood grant that we're going to really be able to step safe streets up because we've been doing it with no funding for the last two years. And I'm hopeful that with the additional resources, we're going to get a lot more done. So lastly, uh, when you're addressing Rick, do you call him your honor or does, <laughs> how does that work? I mean, he used to be your referee right. or the referee in your game. Now he's actually your... He's a participant. Participant. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you so much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Councilor Cruz, I entertain a motion. Hey, just uh, to let Councilor Rodriguez know, the state police that are assigned to the DA's office are not the only state police in the city. There are also uniformed state police that work daily with, with 
that are in my cruises yeah, the, that work yeah, daily yeah. with our... The, we, uh, we have the CAT team, which is the community activation team. We have the gang unit, and they're all infiltrating throughout. The only issue that we have with them sometimes, quite honestly, though, is that there's very limited resources so that we end up sharing those, the CAT team and the, uh, the gang unit with other jurisdictions that need them also. But they're here quite a bit, and they do a really great job for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Motion to recommend favorably back to the full city council. Motion on the floor is properly seconded. Favor of recommendation back to the council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Thank you again, gentlemen. Thank Have a good evening. Much. Thank you. Very much. Nice to see you all. <laughs> Madam Clerk, if you could just note it's favor of recommendation back to the council. And we're going back to, I mean, we're going to the last agenda item, which is 13. Resolve. Be it resolved that the city council requests that the city of Brockton's real estate custodian, Mr. Benjamin Albanese, the city treasurer, Mr. Brophy, and the mayor appear before the finance committee to provide a complete listing of what properties have been sold since his appointment, the schedule of the auction hearings, past, current, future, a full listing of properties currently listed as available, the amount of money raised slash submitted to the general account, and any other information pertinent to the information referenced above. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Benjamin Albanese, Real Estate Custodian, Martin S. Brophy, Treasurer Collector. Attorney Albanese, good evening. And uh, I do want to just note, and, and hopefully everybody got it, uh, Mr. Albanese did a memorandum or a memo for the council. If you don't have one, I know there's some uh, here. Um, council Borga, this is your resolve, correct? No, it's Shane It's Council Bonds' yeah. resolve. Yeah. Albanese, do you have any uh, any statement? Councilor. I mean, they're basically very distinctive questions that the councilor had actually had submitted. So if I could, if we could have Mr. Uh, Albanese go through and answering the questions that are posed on the, uh, did you did you hear what the questions were when she was? You mean on, on this invitation? On the on the order. Oh yeah. And uh, go through those and well, actually answer them one at a time, if you could, please. Um, I was originally invited to the August meeting, which I attended. Prior to the August meeting, I had all of my records scanned and uh, digitally mailed to all of the uh, counselors. And hopefully, you all got that and you all retained it. And what was included in that digital file was a record of every single individual who registered to bid on every single property that we offered in the auction. I have a record of every bid and who bid it and who the successful bidders were. And I, and I forwarded uh, copies of all the notices that went out, samples of all the documents that are uh, offered. And um, well, to start on your list, let's see. What properties have been sold up to this point? What properties have been sold? I sent, uh, I sent that in that digital file also. And I think it's been provided by the treasurer's office also. So I think you have everything that's been asked for in terms of documents and data has been provided to the council at some point or another. So to answer them as, as uh, they appear on the invitation, I think you have a list of all properties that were sold There are no current or future auctions pending right now. Uh, we're in the process of putting another list together for the next auction. Uh, an auction was going to be scheduled for this, um, for October 18th. It's been postponed. Uh, we really needed more properties to make it a successful auction. A full listing of properties currently listed as available. I think you've received that from the, from the treasurer's office. Uh, not all of those properties are suitable for an auction. Some of them aren't marketable. Some, some of them are virtually worthless and, and really would not bring any revenue to the city. I think you have information on the amount of money raised. I think it's in excess of 2.4 million. And here we are 
any other information pertinent to the uh, information referenced above. If, if you all had an opportunity to read the memo that I sent, I think it addresses a lot of questions about the process, um, the statutes that dictate how this is, how it's all run, and um, the results of the auction over the period of time that I've been appointed. Now, just to give you a little history, <coughs> I was, I think 1992 was my first introduction into City Hall. I worked for Mayor Farwell. He was kind enough to hire me at the time. And uh, sometime during his administration into the units administration, I was appointed real estate custodian. And during that period of time, uh, we generated over $6 million through the auction program. Uh, I'd say that was relatively successful. And in the time that I've been appointed under this administration, we're at 2.4 million. So during the time that I was filling the <clears throat> appointed position of real estate custodian, it's been generated almost eight and a half million dollars. And in the time that I wasn't there, um, it, was, it didn't generate even a half million dollars. So I think by any measure, this, this program has uh, created revenue to the city that it wouldn't have had otherwise. These properties, some of them, have been in inventory for over 20 years. So I, I think the numbers speak for themselves. If you have any questions about the process, that's, uh, that's addressed in the memo that I sent you. So I'll field any other questions you might have. Cos Rodriguez, you still have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, um, Mr. Albanese, there's a, um, <coughs> there's a perception of a lack of transparency when it comes to these auctions. I had asked you uh, several, I think in the beginning when you first got appointed. Yeah, I, I remember it well. To basically provide us with a list of properties that are being uh, considered for auction. Mm -hmm. And I think we got it once, but we never got it again. At least, that, at least that's what I'm, I'm telling you, that's what I got. I got it once, never got it again. Can I address that while we're on that subject? Well, let me, just, let me just finish my point because you know how it is when you get a little longer around the tooth, <laughs> you know, you kind of tends to, you tend to forget what you're saying. Yeah, I have that too. Um, <laughs> what happened is that there are quite a few individuals in the community that are not as well connected with um, and I brought this up the other day at the council meeting and somebody said, ah, oh, but some of these properties were are not very good properties. And one of, the, one of the properties that we had actually talked about was a property on Southworth, up on the, on the east side of the city where people actually were living in the house. Do you, do you recall that conversation? Uh, uh, with me? Yeah. Um, I, I don't, but you can refresh so, my memory. So it wasn't, it wasn't just vacant land or right. abandoned buildings. There was actually a single family home Mm -hmm. on the east part of the, uh, of, of the city mm -hmm. where people were residing in, in, the, in that property mm -hmm. and came out to see a bunch of people around the, uh, the property itself being auctioned off. Or at least visited, visited once, the, once the property was, uh, was auctioned off, mm -hmm. there were a bunch of people that came by to see what the property looked like. And I'm so, not aware of that. so it wasn't, it wasn't a vacant land. It was right. actually a, prop, a piece of property that had residents living in. Right. And one of the reasons why I brought that up is that we wanted to be a part of helping you or helping the city getting the word out so that people knew that this, this process was taking place. And thus the lack of You mean of the people clarity. that live there? No, us. Oh, 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 to I be see. able to communicate with the community right. so that they know that this process is taking place. Uh, there's, and, and again, given some clarity, I'm sure either the folks who are living in the house or some other neighbors or somebody from the community itself might pick up those, that property because it was usable property. Correct. And I come back with the fact that, you know, for some odd reason, you failed to provide those lists to us as you went along. You did that the first time out, but that was the a, a once in a 
once in a lifetime thing, and then you well, basically let me decide address not that to do if, that. If I could, um, after no, I mean, this is quite a while ago now. Yeah, it was, and, and it was a legitimate concern. I submit the list to the mayor's office, and I knew it was distributed to all the counselors. And well, I assumed it was, and now I find out that it wasn't. Um, nevertheless, statutorily, I'm only required to post it in in two public places, which I do. I post it at the at the city hall, and I post it at the library. But beyond that. It's put on the city of Brockton website. Also, another website that I've created that's much more visible and much more comprehensive has all the listings on it. It goes in the Brockton Enterprise either once or twice. And all the people that have provided me with an email address, it gets sent to them. So to solve the problem with the city councilors not being aware, all of your email addresses have gone on to the email list and, and as soon as a list is created you will all have a copy of that well that answers and if i knew that earlier I would have put you on the list before no because i we brought i brought that up and uh, i agree there was it fell through the cracks and the ultimate responsibility is mine okay um is there any way you can share with this um there was a, a question that came up, I believe, two meetings ago in terms of the compensation that you receive for yeah. these properties. That's been public from day one. But. It's, it's simply arithmetic. Okay. There was also a question that came out of that particular discussion in terms of, I believe there was a discussion that you had said something that a certain percentage of the of your fees would come back to the city for the city to use as it saw fit? Well, it can't be used as you saw fit because the Department of Revenue wouldn't let us set up that account that way. But I'm saying, but that's how it was presented to us when we were having this discussion. Well, that was three, three years, years ago. ago. Three years ago. And, and in good faith, that's how it was going to be set up. Um, Marty Brophy spent a lot of time with the Department of Revenue to set up a revenue account, and they said it can't be done. So the only way we could do that is I could pay it directly to Coppola and Coppola on behalf of the city. That was the only proper way it could be done, and it's been done. But don't, don't you see that it almost sounds like we're paying for the right, the right to auction properties twice? In a way, you're being paid as the auctioneer, as the uh, real estate custodian, and yet we're paying a law firm to basically run the, uh, the, the records and the title searches and all this other stuff no, that they do? No, A portion of the auctioneer's premium, and 10% is very customary at any auction. Any auction I've gone to, whether it's equipment or real estate, whatever, there's always an auctioneer's premium. Um, it's, uh, similar to in the, in the probate court, they, they appoint commissioners to liquidate property. Their compensation is 10%. 10% is pretty much standard for this type of activity. Um, and I do much more than an auctioneer would do. Auctioneers show up at City Hall for an hour and a half put in one ad in the newspaper and they're gone. They don't qualify the properties. They don't create the lists. They don't go to the properties and walk them to see if there's issues there. And these properties all have one issue or another. Otherwise, we wouldn't have them. So, uh, no, you don't pay twice. Uh, I get 10% and I take 20% of, of that and give it to Coppola. And he's not doing work that I'm supposed to be doing as real estate custodian. He's doing work that either could be done by the city, either in-house by the law department, either in-house or uh, to outside counsel. But not one dime of what's collected is paid to me by the city. There's no municipal funds paid to me. Not one dime of taxpayer money is ever paid to me. I don't appear on a line item 
in any budget anywhere. No, we know that because we, we so have discussed So essentially what the city gets is 102% of every property that's sold, the highest bid on every property that's sold. So I, I can't find a downside to this. No, I'm not saying that there's a downside. I'm just saying that if the idea was, you know, you get your 10% and you're going to turn around and give 2% back to the city. And I did on behalf of the city pay. But now what the we're city would have had to pay Coppola and Coppola, I pay it. So what are we paying Coppola and Coppola for? Um, they do title run-ups. For what, these properties? Yep, to make sure that there's no problems before I put them on the, before I put them on the uh, auction block. I don't want to sell anything that has a problem. I don't, want to, I don't want to auction by ambush, so to speak. But, I want them to be but, qualified properties. But the reason why I'm bring, hold on a second, Marty. The reason why I, I, I brought this up is because when we had discussed, and this is three years ago, we had talked about hiring you, we the city hiring you as the real estate custodian. You, you don't really hire me, but. Appoint, but appoint you as the yeah. real estate custodian. Right. Is that we actually thought we were cutting out the middleman. You know, we're hiring a lawyer. The lawyer is going to do the auctioning, take care of all the paperwork, and basically here's the lump sum to the city and two percent coming back to the community. Well, I, so I, I'm, I, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you understand what I'm coming from with I that with that two percent because we hired a lawyer to do all the lawyering, and yet now we're still using the two percent that we could probably put someplace else to pay a lawyer to do the work that supposedly you were supposed to do. I do a lot of the legal work. I, I, I create all the documents. I do, um, I handle the closings. I do the recordings, none of which would be done by an auctioneer otherwise. And I spend the time to create the lists. Marty helps me. The assessor's office helps me. Um, I, I go to the um, planning board to get it reviewed, reviewed for uh, wetlands issues and, and hazardous waste issues. I don't want to sell properties that are going to come back and uh, you know be a problem. I want to sell properties that are going to be back on the tax rolls, creating tax revenue, um, and auctioneers don't do that. So you get a value-added auctioneer when I'm doing it. They're actually the, the attorneys I hire to foreclose on these properties. So they take all the land court records. Again, land court will not let us foreclose on a property unless every person of interest on that property has been notified of the foreclosure proceedings. Therefore, Attorney Coppola has this full list of who, through land court, they had to notify about the foreclosure proceedings. Therefore, those people have to be notified of the auction as well, legally have to be notified. So it makes sense for them to send out those legal notifications because they have the full list and then the postings as well. But why couldn't, and they also prepare why the couldn't deed. he do that? I don't have the records. They'd have all the records. They've done it, all the work. Why reinvent the wheel? Okay, but I'm saying, okay, let's just say, let's just talk about the past work. Mm -hmm. But future work, why couldn't you do that? Uh, Go after the records, dig up the records, do those things that, as an attorney, you could do so that we can cut out. My whole, my whole well, thing is that... No matter how it goes, I can't give that money directly back to the city. You could give it to the law department. No, I can't. He, he checked with the Department of Revenue. Marty, is that true? He checked with the Department of Revenue. They said we couldn't set up a fund from that. You would actually... As part of the appointment... The 2% was to be used for further proceedings to basically pay Coppola to go back into court, to basically to hit my legal line item. That's what we couldn't do. You couldn't accept the money to just go into my legal line item. At it the had time, to go the, directly to Coppola. It, it would just have to be part of the general fund if we, it was done. And it, based on the way the, the appointment was, the the agreement was written, it was to be specifically used. So the specific use that it was supposed to be could not be done. So instead of me paying out of the budget to have Attorney Coppola prepare the documents, that's how we did it. Whenever I hired an auctioneer as real estate custodian, 
Attorney Coppola appeared, appeared all the legal documents <laughs> and the deeds and all the postings. He got a 2% buyer's premium. The auctioneer got 8. So there was always a 10% buyer's premium. It was an 8 and 2. So when the proposal that Ben had to do that 2% to eventually pay Attorney Coppola to go back into court couldn't be done, why wouldn't we just do what we were doing before, whenever I hired an auctioneer as real estate custodian, and just stick with the procedure that we used before and work? Yeah, but Mr. Brophy, my issue that I have is the fact that we have an, uh, uh, a real estate custodian who's also a real estate lawyer. But he's and, it, and if he's a real estate lawyer, why can the real estate custodian take care of all the in, in legalese that has to do with that? Huh? In which case, he could have actually just kept the 10%. But he told us that he was going to give back the ten, the two percent. So to he to be, used, to be used to supplement. Uh, it's written, it's on the record, to be used to supplement the legal the legal I, budget. I'm, I'm just legal budget. I'm just taking your word for what it's you written. said to us at our meeting. You said, I will take I will take the ten percent, mm -hmm. and then turn around and give the city to the two uh, two percent out of that. 10, right. uh, out and, of the ten percent, and that two percent would go towards supplementing whatever the budget. Well, you said it has for future auctions for whatever the right. deal it was. So I, what I'm saying to you is that That's why couldn't you take why couldn't you take your ten percent and then donate your ten percent to the city for the city to do what it needs to do with it without well, the without, money that goes to Coppola by bypassing Coppola. That's what I'm trying to Coppola say. Coppola does does the foreclosures. Coppola does the foreclosures for half the state of Massachusetts. He's set up to do that. But why couldn't you do that? Do the foreclosures? Mm -hmm. well, that's like asking a dentist to do brain surgery. I'm not, that isn't what I do. Counselor. I don't do foreclosures. Counselor, as treasurer, I hire the attorney. I'm the one who actually forecloses on a property, not a real estate custodian. Okay. It's the treasurer's job. I handle all the tax settlement. Mr. Brophy, as chairman, I, I need some clarification. I'm very confused. So, so 240 grand has been realized as a 10 percent based on 2.4 million. What you're saying is given 20 percent to Coppola, which is 48 grand, mm -hmm. all right? So you made what 100 and 192 grand in your pocket. Correct. But that 48 grand, there's no Mass General Law restriction that says that that 48 grand can't go to the general fund that could be used in Phil Nazarello's office to have a dedicated part-time lawyer for the city of Brockton working to do what Coppola does. There's absolutely no restriction that says that. So what I'm confused is, is what Council Rodriguez is trying to say is, and it makes sense, you can decide who you're going to hire, but there's no restriction that says you can't do what Council is saying. Correct, but it's part of the Correct, but there is, there is no restriction that says that, and that's what Moses is trying to say. Well, again, if, if the 2% got turned over to the city... It would go into the general fund. Go into the general right, fund. but the general fund could then be used. And Mr. Kahn knows that. I mean, it could definitely be used. But that doesn't mean it's going to add an attorney in the law office. I mean, it could be part-time, 48 grand. It could. This is all hypothetical, but it's conjecture grand. that it could be. 48 grand over four years. Yeah, I understand. You made 192 over four years, yeah. too. Not a bad gig. So what I'm trying to say is, what Councilor Rodriguez is trying to say is, it could happen. You're saying that it can't happen, but it could happen. It could. It, it could. Again. That's it. Okay, okay That's Council, are you done with the questions? Yeah, I'm done. Council Lally, you had a question. I'll write the check to anybody. It doesn't matter to me. Right. Okay. So I, I just had, you know, a bit of a question. Something that I've, I've encountered as counselor is um, a, lot of, a lot of families or, you know, people who, who you know, ho homeowners in my ward, there have been spots in their neighborhoods, you know, that's been city-owned property, you know, right next to theirs, that, you know, they, they liked it the way it was. You know, it was, it was there might have been some woods on it, it might have been open. There, there was not any, any house or any, any building or development on that property. And, uh, and they, they, they liked it that way. Uh, given the opportunity, they, you know, time and time again, they tell me, you know, given the opportunity, they would have liked to purchase that property and keep it the way it was, rather than see it go to, you know, completely, completely unbeknownst to them, uh, you know, sold to a, a developer or something like that. 
Um, my, or my, 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 point, my point really is a lot of uh, my constituents, you know, they're, they're, they're very busy. They've got, you know, they, they've got a lot on their plates. They've got families to take care of. Uh, and they don't really have the opportunity to find, you know, to keep an eye out for when these auctions are coming up and if anything, uh, you know, if, if any item is near them. Uh, would, there, would there be any way that, you know, the, the abutters of a property could be notified? We're not required to. No, but uh, it's... It's in the newspaper. Um, and I would send you the notice, and you can notify anybody you want, but I'm restricted to how I can do it. Yeah. Uh, in my position, uh, Chapter 60, Section 77B is very specific about how I can convey title. It has to be through an auction. Yes, no, I, I, I understand that, but no, notifying them that there is an auction. So if they, would, if they would like to acquire the property, they have the ability to come to the auction. Well, you know, these properties aren't, you know, desirable. No, it's... They it's, usually have a problem. The, yes, but a lot of these, a lot of these properties, at one point, uh, you know, at one point, the the con my constituent would have, you know, looked into purchasing the property, and somebody from the city would say, "Don't worry about it. It's a non-buildable lot, or you can't work with this property. It's, you know, it's going to stay in the city. Don't don't bother spending well, the see, money." Well, and then somebody, and then all all of a sudden, they get an invite to the zoning board or the planning board where somebody is looking to build a single family home or something else on the property. Right. Well, so I, I'll tell you what my obligation is. Uh, chapter 60 is the tax collection chapter. I'm essentially a tax collector. And I'm obligated to take any of these properties that the city acquires through foreclosure and liquidate them. Mm. That's what my mission is. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to liquidate these properties and try to recoup the unpaid taxes and put these properties back on the tax rolls. And in the process, if we can improve a neighborhood, that's fine. Usually these properties are neglected. They collect rubbish. There's usually some issue with them that the neighbors don't like. I mean, they're not usually just a nice vacant wooded piece of land. Not, that's, that's really not the norm here. In, in a at least, at least in, in my ward's case, it, it might not be it might not be the norm, but it is pretty frequent. We we don't we has don't that happened already have, in your ward? Yes. Which property was it? I can give you one example. You know, right off the top of my head, it's a uh, lot immediately uh, at the almost at the corner of Belgravia Ave and Winter Street. The residents were informed that that property is not buildable. It is too small. Don't worry about it. Who, invo who informed them of that? I, I do not know. That was long before, it was probably before I, uh, I got out of high school. Yeah, it wouldn't be me. All yeah. right, well, no, I, I, don't, I, don't believe, I don't believe they ever, you know, tried to contact you about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's part of what I'm trying to get to. I, I want, you know, I want them to you know, I, 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 want, I want people to be notified in case, there is, in case there is a property they would rather see stay the way well, it is. Well, uh, so they'd have to buy it to keep it the way yes. it is. Yes, so in, in a lot of people, you know, will tell me, you know, I would have bought that property or I would have I liked to have the chance to acquire that property rather than see a house pop up there. So that's, well, they, they would a, like to. A vacant lot that has a buildable home on it with my experience through these auctions usually sixty five to seventy thousand dollars i don't know if people want to spend that but it, but what you're saying if they had the opportunity to do that give them the so, opportunity so, yeah so give so give me some guidelines here how far do you want a butters within three within three hundred feet or the yes, same similar same similar obligations to, that you have when there's a the zoning board yes i'm not obligated to do that but i'll do it if you want me to Thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. And I, I, uh, I intend to look into that with our uh, legislative council as well, just to make sure that 
uh, going further beyond any of our beyond any of our time on the council and beyond your tenure as real estate custodian that uh, the people who take you know take up these offices next uh, well you'd have, have to the change same. the mass statute we can we can re uh, change it within can't change the it local our, our 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 municipal requirements no no you can't it doesn't apply the municipal rules do not apply <laughs> to tax foreclosed properties Constance, just yeah. a point of information, I'm just yeah. trying to get an understanding. Are you talking about direct abutters where the properties would actually, the locuses would actually touch each other? Direct abutters that would have the same opportunity to potentially buy it, make the yard bigger, put a garden there, whatever? Yes, yeah, same, oh no, same requirements as if you're going before the zoning board or the planning board, a 300 foot radius. Thank you. Yep. We do. I mean, we did have a program called the Abutters Lots Program that's kind of been ignored for a long time, and um, that can be revived. It's. I think we still have it. We use that now. Yeah. Have you been? Yep. If it's under five thousand square feet, which uh, immediately makes it non-buildable, then it's offered. It's offered to the abutters, and if both abutters want it, then we'll split it. That's. I mean, um, that's not under my purview anymore. But the law department can do that. And we did a lot of that when I worked in the law department. We had the Abutters Lots program. And um, if somebody wants to revive that, I, I welcome it. And that's, that's something that I think, you know, at least certainly I, I'll look into. Uh, but if they, if, if residents, you know, within 300 feet could be notified, I think that would, you know, at least to give them the opportunity and extend them that courtesy, I think it would go a long way. Well, after I send a list to any of the counselors, if they have anybody in particular they want notified, we'll notify them. All right, thank you. You're welcome. You good, counselor? Yes. Counselor Isaac, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Good evening. At the beginning, you mentioned that you've developed your own website. That you yes. Have. Can you please give that yeah. to us? It's, it's, in, it's in the. Uh, it's right on here? It's on okay. there. Can you it's pretty comprehensive. It gives all the information you would want about the property, and it has specimens of all the documents you sign and instructions on how to register for the auction and how to bid. It's, uh, it kind of tells you everything. I'm just looking for it really quick. I just want people at home to have it. That way they can go on. Yeah, sure. I just can't find it really I, I welcome more people at, at, at the auctions. The, the more competition Did there is, the better it? it is for the city of Brockton. Ben, you know where it is on your memo? What page it is? Yeah, hold on. Yeah, it's I didn't on. see it when I read find it. Find it? No. Hold on. It's under the notices. RECustodian.com website. The RECustodian.com website contains all the information for the pending auction. List of properties with links. It's linked to the assessor's records, so everything is there. Provides dimensions, zoning, recording history, etc. Copies of all documents to be signed at the auction. Examples. Terms and conditions, memorandum of sale, disclosure statement, successful bidder letter, affidavit of beneficial interest, and instructions to qualify as a bidder. So it gives, it's, it's really um, a source for anybody that's interested in bidding to know what they're getting into and exactly what's going to be expected of them. So that's on the website. I welcome you all to take a look at it. And I, w and I welcome you all to come to the auction so you see how they're run. Well, I actually did attend a few when I was first elected. I, um, I did attend them just to see how the process, um, uh, what the, how the process was. So it's recustodian.com, just Correct. for people at home. Yeah. And um, I, I see them when I do see the postings on the city website. So I view that regularly. I actually have a hard time finding them. Oh, really? Yeah, on the city website. Oh, I, I, I always I mean, tell my constituents at home, the city website, you, people should use it more often. It's a wealth of information, so everything's <coughs> on there. The notice in the newspaper has, has a, um, a photograph to draw people's attention to it, so I think most people get to see that, too. Oh, very good. Uh, the other part of my question is probably for um, Mr. Condon or... Uh, Treasurer Brophy, the one, but maybe Mr. Condon. Thank you, Mr. Albany. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Condon, I, so can you give us a little bit of a history of 
the few years before um, Attorney Albany started doing the auctions, what was the income? I know it was briefly mentioned. I know we've spoken to Treasurer Brophy yeah. about it well, a few well, for, times. Well, for most of the time, the real estate custodian was the treasurer of the city. Correct. Subsequent to that, I think under the units administration, uh, the uh, attorney Albanese in the law office was appointed a custodian, or maybe Thomas Bluff, I forget which, yeah. one or the other. Then it switched back to being the uh, treasurer. In most communities, I think the real estate custodian is, is the treasurer because he normally would have the records with respect to the foreclosures. Um, it has worked, I think, in both structures. Uh, the advantage of having an independent custodian is it has somebody with uh, directed energy on the list of uh, foreclosed properties. The advantage um, or the amount of opportunity varies as the real estate say, cycle varies. At the moment, I think Ben just said, they don't have a particularly good inventory for going to auction again. Once you go aggressively after these foreclosed properties through auction, you clear the inventory. If the real estate market's recovered, and we're not getting the same level of foreclosure. So you've got peaks and valleys in the amount of money available to it. So I think it's worked in both cases. I mean, Ben's generated $2 million and change over the last few years. You can't sneeze at that. But I think at the moment, the opportunity to spend, exert a lot more money on this is, is not really there. And that's, I think that's the history. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Potter. And I know, Mr. Brophy, we've spoken about this numerous times. And your professional opinion about, I know, it was a lot for your department to do when you were doing the... Well, yeah, office. and again, um, in 2007, it came back to being the treasurer. Um, and, and I had been working on this possessions list. Um, and we held auctions in 2007, 9, 10, and 11. Um, I know Ben said about a half a million, but it was probably close to, it was over $2 million that came in in those auctions. Uh, the very first one was a two-day auction. Um, and again, the auctioneers I held, we had um, one was on site, one wasn't. Um, the one on site was a little difficult because you had to run around the city in different spots. Uh, it wound up being a two-day auction, but that was um, that was at a time when um, the inventory was pretty good. We got it down some. Then uh, I took over as treasurer. The philosophy changed, um, and again, the this influx of properties coming in. Um, became greater and actually, you know, uh, again, picking through that list is mundane. It takes a lot. Um, so the fact that there is a dedicated person doing that, I mean, you know, uh, when we get new stuff, Ben knows about it. Um, those usually, when I was doing it as real estate custodian, when I had a, took in a few properties that were worth, then I'd go to that list and try and get, you know, enough to make a real auction out of it. So you feel that it's working oh, yeah. best right now? Okay. No. And again, Mr. Conn is right. The inventory, um, we're not foreclosing on properties. Property values are so well mm -hmm. um, that people are working to save their homes. Um, so it's not as, and again, half the time what we wind up foreclosing is not necessarily, would be a vacant building that's been vacant for years. Um, either the families have passed away, there's no heirs, there's no, and it's just a vacant building um, that is usually shredded by the time the city has foreclosed it and puts it up for auction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Any other Councilors? I entertain a motion then? Favorably to the full city council. This motion on the floor is properly seconded. It's a favorable recommendation back to the full council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. It's a favorable recommendation back to the full council. That's it for the evening, councilors. Before we adjourn, I uh, again, I'm not sure um, where our next meeting will be held, um, but uh, you know, I will. Uh, I'll notify you once I know. Um, I, I'm hopeful that it's going to be back at City Hall, but we'll uh, we'll just have to figure that out. So uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, any moments of personal privilege? We'll go to Councillor Ian Airy first. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Just one more uh, last call out to the fact that tomorrow night uh, I'll be having a Ward 3 meeting at the Kennedy School at 7 o'clock p.m. Again, that's tomorrow night, Tuesday evening, October 17th at 7 p.m. at the Kennedy School on Ash Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, moment of personal privilege. Yes. Uh, this Saturday, October 21st, uh, on behalf of the new Ash Street Park Neighborhood Association, at the Harold Bent Playground. Uh, I would like to invite you to their Harvest Patch from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. 
There will be two costume parades, one at 11.30 and one at 1.30. Ten activity stations for the kids, crafts, Bob for Apples, lots more. Live music, not the council courts. Prizes, free food, come support. You can find info on the website or on, on Facebook. And I know, Council, because I did speak to the gentleman and I spoke to Ms. Smith, they're also looking for donations of pumpkins for the, the pumpkins children as well. So anybody could by Friday, probably. Council, you done, Councilor? Yeah, Councilor Farwell, please. Just, just very out of respect to my colleagues and, and also to the people who have elected me, we tabled the four items tonight that related to Aquaria. What I started to say, and I want to make it very clear, that I do not believe any of us should have to sell that concept. If you're the chief executive officer of this city and you want to spend $78 million, which is a sum far greater than anything I ever saw when I was in the mayor's office, then you should be out in the community holding meetings, convincing the residents that that's the right thing to do. Because the calls I'm getting are running probably six to four, if not seven to three against the Aquaria plant. So we don't have full-time staff. We don't have experts available to us. It should not be our responsibility to have to go to meetings and to discuss all of the nuances of Aquaria. And I'm especially tickled to see that now, because you and I, Mr. Chairman, filed something about MWRA, now they've thrown a little politics into it. Now, that, now they've started to analyze the MWRA without any input from us, plainly so that they can paint the MWRA as an alternative that's not viable, and I'm not convinced of that yet. So I think it's time for those who want that project to do the work. I think it's time for them to get out there and make the public aware of all of the information that's necessary. And I would say to the mayor and to Mr. Condon, there are escalating requirements in the current water service agreement in terms of production, in terms of distribution, in terms of improvements to the plant. What I would do is I would go back and say to Aquaria, you're about to spend a lot of money over the next 10 or 11 years. Let's cap the amount of gallons you have to produce at three million. That will greatly reduce the amount of money they have to outlay. That will negate the need to go get another permit for another five million gallons, uh, uh, approval for another five million gallons of production, and maybe that will lower the cost to the city for the current Aquaria plant. But I feel very passionately that not our job. Don't dump all of this information on us. Don't be the one to tell us, well, you need to hear from this person, you need to hear from the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, and you need to hear from the Chairman of the Water Commission. Never once has anyone said, what would you folks like to know? What, what's most important to you before you make this decision? Never once has that happened. Never once has the public been mentioned, except that they want a home rule petition that would negate a vote which is actually required when you purchase a water source or a water plant. We don't want to hear from the citizens. And I, I just find it staggering. I, I, uh, I think if I've noticed anything since I've come back into city government, every once in a while there is such an arrogance of power that I, that I don't understand it. And I, I thank the indulgence of my colleagues. I have the greatest respect for all of you. That's why I voted to table this because I think a lot more work has to be done by people other than us. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Councilor. Anything else before us? Meetings adjourned. Have a good evening. <laughs>